Hmm? Hi, Daisy. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Alvit. I'm the director of the School of Orthoptics, and it's our pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. Good morning. Um, so I think because we have a very busy schedule for today, uh, we will start on time. Mm -hmm. um, I will let uh, uh, Guy Barnett Itzhaki, he's the head of the Israeli Orthotics Association, uh, to introduce you. Thank you. Hey, can everyone see the screen? Yes. Yes. So hello everyone, um, I'm excited to introduce uh, Daisy Gotts. She is a senior principal orthoptist at the uh, Andrew University Hospital at the Department of Ophthalmology since 93. She graduated in uh, 1982 in Utrecht uh, in the Netherlands in orthoptics. She is a clinical teacher for orthoptic students at the Dutch Academy of Orthoptics at Utrecht and in the Netherlands. And she also teaches orthoptics uh, in uh, schools in Belgium. She's the, she was the president of the Belgian Orthoptic Association. She's represented for Belgium in uh, the International Orthoptic Association. She is treasurer and congress organizer of the Donders Association of Strabismology. And she is scientific board member of the World Society of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus. She has delivered eye care in charity organizations all around the, gro the globe, as we can see, in different countries, in uh, different uh, continents. Uh, she is a true educator, and wherever a uh, orthoptic education is needed, you can find her. You can find her uh, there all around the globe. Uh, from Nigeria to, uh, uh, to Israel, uh, uh, Australia, and so on. And some trivia thing that you don't know about her, but she knows and speaks five languages. So uh, we are excited and thrilled to hear you, Daisy. The stage is yours. Thank you very much, Guy, for this very nice uh, presentation. Um, well, uh, 
Um, it's a pleasure for me to, uh, to speak for you. Um, I'm sorry not to be there because I like to come to Israel. And as you all know, two years ago, it was canceled because of COVID. So we do it this way. I told everybody I'm speaking uh, in Tel Aviv and uh, one of uh, an old patient of mine sent me a message. Oh, you're in Tel Aviv. Me too. Let's meet. And then I answered her yesterday. No, I'm sorry, I'm going to talk for Tel Aviv students, but unfortunately, I'm in Antwerp, Belgium. So, okay, uh, that said, we are going to, um, to start. Yes, so the first talk of this morning will be about uh, the working of the diplopic patient. So when you um, see a patient with diplopia, uh, it's important to ask at first, do you really see two images? And if not, then probably it's blurred vision, which can be come from uh, refractive problems, media problems, or macular problems. If yes, it's really diplopia, we see two images, then you ask, do you see double when you cover one eye? If not, patient sees not double, then it's a binocular problem and the patient is sent to orthoptics. If yes, it's a refractive media or macular problems. And these are all the problems uh, which can cause monocular diplopia as uncorrected astigmatism or other refractive errors, spectacle abbreviations, a dry eye or other ocular surface uh, disorders, corneal scars, a keratoconus, a mass or a swelling of the eyelid, pterygium before or after surgery, a neuridectomy or iridotomy, cataracts can cause monocular diplopia, a subluxation of the natural or the pseudophagic implant lens, vitreous abnormalities, and cystoid macular edema. Often it's more blurred vision instead of really monocular diplopia. If uh, the patient really uh, complained of binocular diplopia, our next question is how is the diplopia? Is it horizontally? And then you can already think of different diagnoses. When it's vertical, it can be other diagnoses. Oblique diplopia gives, again, other possibilities. And tilted diplopia is mostly related to a fourth nerve palsy. We also ask, do you have double vision only at near, only at distance or both? Is it in primary position and are in certain or all directions of gaze? Or is it only in horizontal direction or only in a vertical direction? Is the diplopia permanent or is it intermittent? And if it's intermittent, is it in the morning, the evening, after an effort, when tired, after reading? How is the onset of the diplopia? Is it sudden? You got up with diplopia, for example, or is it intermittent? And then intermittent, for example, only after work or after an effort. How is the progression of the diplopia? There is no difference since the beginning. It's better since the beginning or it's worse since the beginning and also ask if the patient can think of any cause of diplopia, especially is there any trauma? Uh, we ask for systemic diseases and sometimes we know it, sometimes we don't know it. Is there uh, a history of tumor, aneurysma or cerebral accident? If not, we have to sometimes look for these things. We also ask for previous old childhood strabismus and previous treatments, surgery, classes, occlusion or presence, and if there was an amblyopic eye. Then we start with the observation. 
And we start with um, when we uh, ask, we uh, if um, we examine or we we look to the patients and we look to the eyelids. We look if we see optosis or uh, pseudoptosis, if we see uh, eyelid retraction, or if we see any abnormal eye movement when talking to the patients. We evaluate the palpebral fissures. Do we have mongoloid or anti-mongoloid palpebral fissures? Uh, do we see an epicanthus or broad nasal bridge? Especially during your history taken, you evaluate your head posture, the head posture of the patients. Uh, do we see a tilt to the right or the left shoulder? Do we see a face turn to the right or to the left? Do we see a chin depression or chin elevation? And that's very uh, important to do it before you start with your examination. We also look to the position of the globes. Do we see any exophthalmus or anophthalmus or any facial asymmetry, as you can see here? And then we take our little light and we evaluate the pupils. Uh, is there any anisocoria, unilateral bilateral midriasis or meiosis or abnormal pupil shapes, as you can see here? And then we start our uh, orthoptic examination with first the light reflex. We look if we see an isotropia, exotropia, hypotropia, or hypertropia, or a combination of these. Also, we look if we see any presence of nystagmus. And this is not working, the animation, I see. That's a pity. Um, so we see if we uh, have a jerk or a pendular nystagmus, the direction of the nystagmus, is it horizontal, vertical, or torsional? And um, is it in both eyes or in one eye? Is it more in one eye than in the other eye? Uh, that's all important to look at. Um, the eye position we evaluate with our cover test and our alternate cover test. So first of all, we do the cover uncover test to see if there is any manifest deviation. And then we continue with the uh, alternate cover test to see if we have any, we have more, uh, a, a larger deviation, or we see also a vertical component or a DVD. We always do the, 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 the eye position evaluation at near, at distance, and if necessary, also far distance, which means you look out of a window or in a corridor more than at least six meters away. Because for example, if patients are driving, they look further than the six meters of our room. It's always important to check right and left fixation, especially if you have paralytic strabismus and you do your uh, evaluation with or without your abnormal head posture. Then we start measuring the deviation and our method of choice is the alternate prism cover test. Um, this can be done only in patients with good cooperation and good fixation. And we cover and hold the prism in front of the eye till there is no uh, movement anymore. But how do we hold the prism? Do we do it before the deviated eye, the dominant eye, or both eyes. This depends on the uh, amount of deviation you have to measure. And if we have large combined horizontal and vertical deviation, then our measurement will be a little bit less correct or less accurate than when we measure small deviations. We can do it with prism bars, with loose prisms, or we can also use Fresnel prisms. It's also important if you measure, uh, if you do a measurement of with right and left fixation. In this uh, patient, we, when we she's fixating with the right eye, then we have to hold the prism in front of the deviated eye or the eye we are going to measure, the left eye. If we do measurement with the left. Uh, if fixation with the left eye, then you hold the prism in front of the right eye. So 
if you do like right and left fixation measurement, it's important to hold your prism in front of the eye you're going to measure. Otherwise, your measurements are not correct. Uh, sorry, here you can see it a little bit clearly. So right fixation, you hold it for the left eye. Left fixation, you hold it for the right eye. We use the Maddox rods um, in patients who have nystagmus, very small deviation that you cannot see with your eye, cyclodeviation, and especially in gaze palsies, it's the only way to measure your deviation. So in this case, for example, uh, this um, man, he has a total vertical gaze palsy. So if you cover him, you cannot see any vertical movement. So your vertical deviation can you only measure with your uh, Maddox rod, stripes vertical, and you get a horizontal line. And then he can say if he sees the line through the, the light, which means no vertical deviation or above or below, and which means he has a vertical deviation. On the other hand, when you have a person with a horizontal gaze palsy, which means there is no horizontal movement, the only way to measure your horizontal deviation is with your Maddox rod. And again, and then you have to uh, hold your stripes uh, horizontally, a uh, vertical, no horizontal to get a vertical line, and then it can be in the middle of the light or left or right of the light. The double Maddox rod we use to measure cyclodeviations. So we use a red and a white uh, Maddox glass. Uh, mostly you do it when you have a vertical deviation. So then the patient sees two lines. When both lines are not parallel, then you have a, a cyclodeviation. And then it's important that you can uh, adjust your cyclotorsion with your frame um, with your frame. And the patient has to rotate the, the glass until both uh, lines are parallel. This again can be done at distance and near and in different case directions. My favorite, the synoptophore, it's so use, useful, for example, uh, especially for large and vertical and, and combined deviations. Here again, it's also in paralytic uh, strabismus. Um, we need, we, we have to know what's the, the, the amount of the deviation when you fixate in primary position. So here in the synoptophore with right fixation, you put your arm on zero and you measure the deviation of your left eye. Then you put, you put your arm, the left arm on zero and you measure the deviation of your right eye. Um, it's super exactly, in, when you measure it in the synoptophore, because when you do it uh, in your room, you're never 100% sure if the patient is really looking in primary position. Sometimes it can be five degrees to the right or five degrees to the left. And in the synoptophore, you can exactly measure it. And here you see right fixation, uh, a hypertropia of the left eye, left fixation, uh, the, the vertical deviation is much larger. Here you see an uh, isotropia of the, uh, the left eye, but when the left eye fixates, the isotropia is much larger. So anyway, in <coughs> case of paralytic strabismus, you always uh, measure the, the deviation with right and left fixation. Also for cyclodeviation, it's useful the synoptophore, you can measure with right fixation your excyclotorsion, for example, of your left eye, and with left fixation, the excyclotorsion of your uh, right eye. And again, for example, in a uh, bilateral fourth nerve palsy, you can measure it when looking down, you put your arms of the synoptophore 20 or 25 degrees down, and 20, 25 degrees up, and you can measure your cyclo deviation in up and down days. Other methods to uh, measure your deviation uh, is the Hirschberg test. 
Uh, it's an objective estimation. It's not really a measurement, but it's useful in babies, uncooperative child and adults or patients with a very poor fixation. And we all know that one millimeter displacement is seven degrees or 15 prism diopters of deviation. But what about a positive angle kappa? As in this patient, who you see that the, um, the light reflex is on the nasal side of the pupil. What is her um, deviation? Well, she's perfectly right. So that's the problem with your angle kappa. Or in this patient, we see uh, an, uh, a light reflex on the nasal part of the pupil, but if we cover, it's still on the nasal part. So is this a positive angle kappa or is this eccentric fixation? It's something we have to look at. The prism reflection test or Krimsky, uh, Krimsky test is also useful in patients with nystagmus, poor cooperation, poor vision, or restrictive strabismus who cannot fixate in primary position. While mostly we hold the prism in front of the straight eye <clears throat> until the light reflex in the deviated eye is in the middle of the pupil. But sometimes we have to hold the prism in front of the deviated eye. For example, in this patient, exo, if we cover him, then the eye doesn't move. He has a large restriction of his uh, eye movement, so he cannot fixate in primary position. So in this patient, if we have to measure his, uh, his deviation by Krimsky, we have to put the prism in front of the deviated eye until both reflexes are in the middle. Because if you put the prism in front of the straight eye, this eye doesn't move, so you can't measure it. <clears throat> After our, if we know our eye position, we have measured the eye position, we continue with ocular motility and we look for changes in deviation. So your deviation in primary position, we look, is the deviation in primary position changing in all directions of case? And we look for limitations or mechanical restrictions in all directions of case. We start with horizontal gaze and we evaluate the horizontal deviation. We have an ESO in primary position, which is smaller looking to the, uh, right and larger looking to the left. And what we see is that there is a limitation of abduction here, yeah. And we, um, we quantify the limitation of abduction. So a minus four limitation is that the eye can move until the midline. If we have a minus three, patient can do 25 of full rotation, minus two, 50% of full rotation, minus one, 75% of full rotation, minus five or even minus six means that the eye cannot move until the midline. And so sometimes the eye blocks in the, the deviated position. So here we see a uh, minus four limitation of a, a deduction. In this patient, for example, we have primary position. She looks straight uh, to the uh, right too. And here you see an exo due to a limitation of adduction. And this, I would say it's a minus three limitation of adduction. And if we quantify the limitations, then you can, uh, without showing measurement, you can even say to your colleagues, well, I have a patient with this and this amount of limitation. And when somebody else sees the patient, then we know that the limitation is better or worse. Um, so we have evaluated the horizontal deviation, but it's also uh, important to evaluate the vertical deviation when looking to the right and to the left. And here you see a hypotropia of the right eye, which increases looking to the right and decreases looking to the left. And this is the way we uh, note it in our files. Uh, we continue with vertical gaze and we uh, evaluate the horizontal deviation to find A and V patterns. 
as you can see here. But also an X pattern is possible or an um, Y pattern or a Lambda pattern, as you can see. So it's uh, mostly these are mechanical uh, patterns, while a normal A and a V is not really a mechanical pattern. In vertical gaze, we also evaluate the vertical deviation and we look uh, if we see any limitation, as you can see here, no deviation in primary position. Looking up, you see a left hyper deviation. Looking down, a right hyper deviation, because she has a minus three limitation of elevation and a minus two limitation of depression. Uh, in this case, we have uh, a small hypotropia in primary position, straight eyes looking down, and a large hyper hyper deviation, uh, uh, left hyper deviation in up gaze because of a limitation of minus four of the elevation. Then we continue in oblique gaze and we look for over and under actions of the oblique muscle. And again, we quantify the, the, the over action or under action as you can see here. So here in this boy, you see it's normal. And here you see a, uh, a minus four a limitation of adduction or an under action of the inferior oblique muscle. Um, here in down case, we do the same. Uh, we quantify the over and the under actions. As you can see here, you have a minus two under action. And here you have a minus three over action. So it's important to, uh, to quantify your over and under actions. If we have a vertical deviation in primary position or in any of the um, your gazes, you um, do your Bischofsky head tilt test and you evaluate your hypertropia uh, when your head is tilted to the right or to the left. And as you can see here, it's quite obvious that this is straight and this is a hypertropia of the right eye. But sometimes it's not so clear and then it's important to measure your deviation with prism. So you measure your hypertropia tilting to the right and tilting to the left. And uh, if you do it at distance fixation, it's much more easier to see. Uh, so do always, I always do my Bilshovsky head tilt test fixating in the distance because it's just much easier. Um, the three steps test, it's, uh, it's something we also use during motility evaluation. Here in the first step, we have if we have a hypertropia, for example, of this right eye, then there are four muscles who can cause this hypertropia. Your right inferior rectus, or right superior oblique, or your left uh, inferior oblique, or left uh, superior rectus. Then in the first, the second step, you, the patient has to look to the right and to the left and you see where the hypertropia increases. In this case, the hypertropia increases looking to the left. So this means that this hypertropia can be caused by this left superior rectus or the right superior oblique. Had it be on the other side, then these two muscles were uh, possibly the, those who caused the hypertropia. In your third step, you do your Bilshovsky head tilt test, and you tilt to the right and to the left. And if your hypertropia uh, increases in the direction of your hypertropic eye, then you have a superior oblique palsy. So it's very easy to detect uh, in this way, which is the, the, the muscle that is uh, affected. In case this is not very clearly, or in case of a neurological patient, it's sometimes uh, necessary that you lay down the patient. Um, and you see if there is a difference in suspine, in upright, upright and suspine, supine position. 
And if your hypertropia decreases for more than 50%, then it's highly specific for a skew deviation. If the hypertropia uh, remains the same, then it's probably a fourth nerve palsy or an other vertical strabismus. Um, if we see a limitation in one eye, then it can be or a palsy or a mechanical restriction. Uh, here it's more mechanical. If we see a limitation in both eyes, so here we see both eyes have an elevation, a limitation of elevation. This can be due to a gaze palsy or due to a mechanical restriction of both eyes. In case, for example, of a um, thyroid eye disease, both eyes often cannot move up. We evaluate the ocular motility with the alternate cover test and we measure it with the, al uh, we met the, with the alternate prism cover test uh, if necessary. I don't do that always, only when it's, when it's uh, necessary. You can always use your Maddox in all directions of gaze to see any difference. This is especially useful in patients with nystagmus or with a poor fixation, where your alternate prism cover test is, or your alternate prism cover test is, is not uh, easy to, um, to do. Um, to, uh, we, <coughs> we, we continue and we compare duction and versions. Here you see a lady with a limitation of elevation. So this can be really a restriction or a, a paresis, but it can also just be an overaction of this eye. So then you um, close the, the, the overacting eye. This eye, which looks that she has a limitation, you try to get the eye up. If the eye doesn't go up, you know that it's really a limitation of elevation. And your ductions, uh, your limitations, you can measure in the synoptophore. So in horizontal, you can measure your abductions, uh, your arm goes out. You can measure your adduction with the arm in. Don't forget, if you measure abduction to put your PD on maximum. And when you measure adduction, you have to put your PD on minimum. And your elevation, you put your arm up and depression, you put your arm down. When you measure elevation, you put your chin rest completely down. When you measure depression, you put your chin rest completely up. If you always do that, then your measurements will be always the same. So all your colleagues will, should do it the same way. Otherwise, you cannot compare your measurements. Another way to measure your ductions it's, is in the Goldman parameter. If you have it, you can do it there. The advantage is that you can, uh, you, you can do larger measurements. Uh, in the Goldman parameter, you can, your eye can move like 60 degrees. In the synoptophore, it's only horizontally 40 and vertically uh, 30. It's important also to evaluate your smooth pursuit movements always in patients with uh, neurological diseases. Um, and then we look, is the movement complete and is the movement smooth or not? Um, sometimes we see saccadic smooth pursuit movement. So when we do it in horizontal and vertical uh, direction, this is very smooth. Then uh, the same, we evaluate the saccades and we do it in horizontal and vertical way. And you see, is the saccade complete uh, or is it hyper or hypometric? And is the velocity of the saccade uh, normal? Sometimes you see a very slow saccade to one side or the other side, and also in vertical direction. And here the animation is working. So we evaluate, we have evaluated this tachmus in primary position. And now you have to um, evaluate your nystagmus in, um, in the other directions of gaze. 
So you you look when you when you're looking to the right and to the left, do you see a change of your nystagmus? Uh, the direction may change, the frequency or amplitude may change. Uh, some it stays in a horizontal nystagmus. Does it stay horizontally when looking up and down, or is it changing to an up or a down beat nystagmus? So it's important during your eye movements to uh, look into the nystagmus too. And then uh, we evaluate the eyelids, the palpable fissures, the retraction, protrusion of the eyeball and pupil size during your eye movement. Here you see a ptosis of the right eye, which becomes an uh, eyelid retraction looking to the left and an increase of ptosis looking to the right. And here you see that the ptosis is also, you don't have a ptosis here, but eyelid retraction when looking down. Also the pupil is larger here and smaller there. So this is a person with an aberrant regeneration of your Turner of palsy. So, and here you have a little bit of everything. Sometimes in Duane syndrome, you see the protrusion and the, and the retraction of the eyeball. And then finally, you evaluate the convergence. Well, I have put here eight points. Your ocular motility, you cannot see everything uh, at once. So I always teach my students that if you have neurological patients uh, with eye uh, um, motility disorders, you work step by step. Uh, you first look to the changes in deviations, you look for limitations and mechanical restrictions, you compare versions and inductions, you evaluate smooth pursuit movement, desiccate, you, then you go and look if you see any nystagmus or does the nystagmus change, then you're going, especially looking to the, um, the change in, uh, in uh, eyelids and palpable fissures and so on. And finally, you end with your convergence. If you do it step by step, you will not miss anything. If you try to see everything directly, then you will uh, miss one of these things. Well, our uh, ocular motility examination ends with um, a recording of the deviation with a Hess, Lancaster, Lees, Weiss, uh, any screen uh, where you can record the deviation. It's very useful to find hidden or very small deviations. These two deviations, this deviation, I, I miss when I do only my motility examination because it's too small to see. It's very useful also for the follow-up of palsies of mechanical restrictions. Here you see a six nerve palsy, which is better here. Uh, for pre and post-operative measurements, pre-op and post-op, you can show it to the patient. And for evolution of a disease, for example, in case of thyroid eye disease, before and after uh, cortical therapy. And we in Belgium, we often have to do a field of binocular single vision for driver licenses. So here you, um, you, re well, you, you, you record the, the field where a patient has double vision and where there is single vision. And then you can evaluate the position, the size and the shape. Uh, this is mostly an, a, a central uh, field of binocular single vision is mostly seen in patients with uh, mechanical um, problems or problems uh, or palsies in both directions. Here, this is a field of somebody with a six nerve palsy and of somebody with a four nerve palsy. Um, yeah, here you can see the field of binocular vision uh, decreases when the deviation gets larger, which is normal. And then we come to our diagnosis. So if we have horizontal diplopia, which is more at distance than at near, then we can think about, for example, an age-related distance isotropia. 
this is not a very this is not uh, a dangerous thing uh, you see it mostly in patients uh, after the age of 60 who have no uh, neurological diseases we will find small isodeviations who will increase a little bit in lateral gaze but not really in competent strabismus so horizontal diplopia only at distance think of age-related distance isotropia or of course also a six nerve palsy, but then you will find a larger isodeviation, you will see difference in right and left fixation, and you will find a limitation of abduction. If your horizontal diplopia is more at near than at distance, then probably uh, it is, uh, uh, it can be accommodative isotropia, and then it's important to check your uh, refraction, or it can also be due to convergence problems, uh, convergence insufficiency, your exotropia will be larger at near, or a convergence spasm, then your uh, isotropia will be larger at near. If a patient has only horizontal diplopia in lateral gaze, then it may be a six nerve palsy or a supranuclear palsy or thyroid eye disease, for example, with a limit and uh, restriction of the abduction. And if there is no difference in uh, far near and lateral gazes, then it can be an acute acquired concomitant isotropia. It's in all directions, all distance a little bit the same, or a decompensated isophoria, all strabismus, for example, or consecutive strabismus. And more in vertical gaze, then probably uh, it's uh, due to a RV patterns, horizontal strabismus. I mean, when we have uh, when we have vertical diplopia, which is more in elevation, then we can think of thyroid eye disease, Brown syndrome, blowout fracture, or myasthenia. More in depression, especially trauma or myasthenia and more in lateral gaze than mostly it's fourth nerve palsy. When somebody is complaining of oblique diplopia, then it can be, you have to think about a third nerve, fourth nerve palsy, trauma, multiple palsies, and again, thyroid eye disease, more muscles can be affected. And when the patient uh, complains of tilted or oblique, uh, not, not oblique, um, cyclo-diplopia, uh, then it's mostly an uh, acquired uh, fourth nerve palsy or a bilateral fourth nerve palsy. If we have, um, we find paralytic strabismus, uh, it's important to, uh, to know if it's uh, acquired or it's a decompensation of a long-standing or congenital uh, strabismus. Um, so your diplopia will be sudden. Patient comes and says, I see double since then. Uh, in case of congenital or long-standard, then it will be intermittent diplopia. Yeah. Uh, your ocular motility will be very incomitant in acquired and much more concomitant in a congenital or long-standing palsy. The deviation of will there will be a, di a difference between the primary and secondary deviation, so fixation with the right and the left eye in case of required, but you will not see that in case of long-standing. Patient is aware of a third of a uh, abnormal head posture in acquired strabismus. He will say, "When I do my head like this, I don't see double." While they are not aware, they are unaware of their abnormal head posture in congenital. Uh, your has here you will see uh, two um, different shapes of fields. While in long-standing and congenital palsies, you, the fields will be about the same of size and they will be in totally shifted. Suppression will be absent in uh, acquired palsies and may be present in congenital palsies. Fusion, and especially here then vertical fusion, will be normal in acquired and will be enlarged or shifted 
in congenital or long-standard palsy. So this is to differentiate between acquired and congenital. If we have to, to, to differentiate between neurological and mechanical, well, then your deviation in primary position will be much larger in case of a neurological palsy than in case of a, a mechanical. You will have often large limitations and small uh, deviations. Think about a Duane, for example, small deviation in primary position, huge uh, limitation of abduction. Diplopia will be the same in all directions, but may reverse in mechanical strabismus. So um, ESO to the right, EXO to the left, for example. In motility, your duction will be better than your version in case of neurological palsies, and your duction will be the same as your version in case of mechanical palsies. In neurological strabismus, you don't see retraction of the eyeball, which can be present in um, mechanical strabismus. Uh, abnormal head posture is brushed, can be present in both. On your head, you will see a limitation in the gaze of the palsy, while in mechanical strabismus, you will see your limitation opposite in the case of the palsy or the limitation, I would better say limitation here. For example, you will have a limitation of abduction, for example, in thyroid eye disease because of a tight medial rectus muscle. So your abduction is limited, but the problem is the medial rectus, so opposite. Pain will be absent in neurological palsies, but may be present in mechanical ones. Your first duction test is normal in neurological palsies and may be limited in mechanical. And your um, eye pressure is mostly normal in neurological and will be higher in the case of the limitation in case of a mechanical um, palsy. Then what is um, dangerous binocular diplopia? Well, if you see multiple palsies, other neurological symptoms, young patients, other symptoms like pain, headache, anisocoria, blurred vision, ptosis, dizziness, nystagmus, a progressive palsy or a palsy which doesn't resolve, a history of cancer, um, visual field defects, and disturbed color vision. If you have one of these symptoms, then think about dangerous diplopia. If you see a fourth nerve palsy in a patient from 80, it's not dangerous diplopia. Uh, but if you see a third nerve palsy in a, in a person of 20, that's, for example, dangerous diplopia. So, uh, that's why it's important to know which are the, the signs of uh, dangerous uh, type of well, dangerous problems. Okay, so we have uh, done our examination, we have made our diagnosis. Now we're going to manage the diplopia. So we're going to look for binocular single vision. And how are we going to look for binocular single vision? Well, we correct the deviation with prisms until the patient has binocular single vision. And then we are going to measure if there is any fusion or range or a suppression scotoma. If we don't find any fusion, don't forget to think about cyclotorsion or anisoconia. These are reasons the patient cannot fuse. If you have a patient with vertical deviation and you put a prism in front of the eye, you correct the deviation and he has still no single vision, then probably there is torsion in the history. Um, if we look for binocular single vision or suppression scotoma, so you can do it just with your prism, um, bar, but sometimes it's difficult and you don't know if it's uh, suppression 
or really fusion. So then you can use uh, the Bagolini glasses, for example, and then if there is sensory fusion, the patient will see a cross. If there is suppression, the patient will see one line only. Also, the word for dot test is useful, especially for students, for uh, beginners. Uh, if you um, use word for a dot test with your prisms, then you can um, correct the deviation and then you can see when you correct the deviation if there is fusion or if the patient suppresses one uh, of, of, of the eyes, the right or the left eye. Or in the synoptophore, yeah, you can also measure if there is fusion or not. Is there, for example, here with the rabbit, with the tail and the flowers. So is there is fusion, the, the patient sees one rabbit with the tail and the flowers. Or with the house, uh, there's either one or two persons in the house. And then we will manage diplopia. We can give prisms, we can do occlusion, exercises, Botox, surgery. First of all, you start with non-surgical therapy mostly, and then you finally can go to, 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 to surgery. Um, when the deviation is small, we always uh, use prisms. I will have later this morning uh, a, a lesson on prisms, so I will not really go into it. Occlusion is done in diplopia, uh, when the, uh, the deviation is too incompetent or too large to give prisms. Exercises, well, orthoptic exercises only um, can be done in certain uh, diseases or um, abnormalities. Botox is a very useful tool. Uh, always think about Botox in any total uh, six nerve palsy to prevent the, the contracture of the medial rectus. We always uh, put Botox in the ipsilateral medial rectus in all patients who have a minus four limitation of abduction in case of a six nerve palsy to prevent the contracture. And it gives you more possibilities for surgery later. So um, I still have a few minutes, I think, or um, yes, I still have a, a few minutes to, to show you some cases of uh, diplopia. This is uh, the, my first patient I want to share with you. It's um, um, a lady who had in uh, 64 a car accident with concussion and an orbital floor fracture of the right eye. Um, she, um, she has diplopia when looking up and looking down. And if we look to her in primary position, as you can see here, she has a little bit of uh, an ophthalmus of the right eye, but straight eyes. So if we measure it with the alternate prism cover test, we have like a mini exophoria and a mini right hyperphoria, uh, left, sorry, left hyperphoria. At distance fixation, it's only two prism diopters of left hyperphoria. Synoptophore, also only one degree. Then if you do your ocular motility examination, um, you see a limitation of elevation and here you don't see it really, but she has a very small limitation of uh, depression. Let's see if I have her here too, yeah. Uh, so we have a minus four here limitation of elevation and we have a well, 0 0.5 limitation of depression. She has normal pursuit and saccades and she has a retraction of the right eye in elevation here. And you see this eye is the, the, the right eye goes in a little bit. She has normal convergence. Here are the measurements. And if we measure it in synoptophore, when looking up, she has a left hypertropia of nine degrees and looking down uh, two and a half uh, of uh, hypertropia of the right eye. The elevation is seven degrees and the depression is 25 degrees. And this is her um, 
has screen and you see the large limitation of elevation and the small limitation of depression. So what can we do with this lady? Because in primary position, we don't have to do anything. She's very good, but uh, she has problems, especially when, with reading and she gets tired from looking. So what have I done? Uh, I have given her small vertical prisms in her distant glasses because uh, to correct the hyper deviation of the left eye, what she also has when looking up. And I have put uh, the opposite prism for base up on the left eye to correct the hypo, uh, the hypertropia of the right eye for looking down. And here you also see her field of binocular single vision. So you see that when she looks like five degrees up, she has already um, diclopia. So with the prism glasses in her this with the prisms in her distance glasses, um, this will be a little bit better. And with the prism in the reading glasses, her field of binocular single vision will be enlarged looking down. So this is our patient you can easily uh, correct with. Uh, you can help with prisons. Sorry. This is a guy who had uh, a motorcycle accident. Uh, he had a hematoma on the left eye. Uh, he had multiple uh, facial fractures. Um, he had uh, hemocenus of his maxillaris and phenoidalis. So he had really uh, a bad mot motorcycle accident. When I saw him, he had an exotropia of uh, his left eye and a right for the uh, prism diopter right hypertropia. Um, when he was looking at distance, it was less. And here we see a um, small hypertropia of the left eye. If we measure his, his ductions, then you see he had good abduction, but limitation of adduction, uh, limitation of elevation and depression. And here you see, I don't know if you can see it well, but you see, a small field of the left eye with the limitation of depression, elevation, and adduction. So he had a left orbital uh, reconstruction the next day. And this is one week after the reconstruction. So his uh, small right hypertropia changed in a larger left hypertropia, much larger at distance. And he had uh, now also a small limitation of abduction, but the adduction and the, and the elevation improved. The depression got worse. So because it was so um, incompetent, uh, we did occlusion of the left eye because it was not possible to treat this with prisons. Two months after the reconstruction, um, he, um, he had diplopia in all directions of gaze, except in primary position. And as you can see here, he had still his uh, anophthalmus, but in primary position, he had no deviation anymore. With Maddox, no deviation, and uh, synoptophore, no deviation in primary position. And you see all the ductions improved. He got a bone implant because of his extreme anophthalmus. Uh, for the medial and uh, orbital floor. And this is two months after his, oh, oh, wait, after his bone implant. And uh, here he had only diplopia in extreme left gaze and up gaze, but for the rest he was uh, diplopia. All his ductions improved. And here is his, uh, this is a Lan Lancaster screen. And this is amazing how his ocular motility improved. And this is, for example, two years after the, the accident. And you see he's looking good again uh, with quite good ocular motility. So sometimes we don't, we don't have to do surgery and sometimes uh, things go well on itself. Unfortunately, it's not always a success story, as in this guy, mostly is the opposite. But I wanted to show that if you see this guy the first time like this, 
you wouldn't think with all these factors that without doing any ocular surgery is looking like that afterwards. Um, this is, um, I still have time, yeah, a few minutes. Um, this is a lady uh, with uh, thyroid eye disease. Um, I follow her for, for many, many years. And so the first time she came, she had diplopia in lateral gaze and up gaze and blurred vision. And uh, she had a proptosis, as you can see here. So she had an exo and hi left hyperphoria. So no diplopia in primary position. Um, she only had a limitation of elevation in abduction, as you can see here. And, but because of her uh, proptosis, uh, uh, because of her um, increase of amplitudes and a decrease of latency and compression of the optic nerves, she got uh, an orbital decompression. And one week after the decompression, she complained of permanent horizontal diplopia because of a large ESO deviation due to the orbital decompression. So there was a three wall orbital decompression was done. And one of the consequence of orbital decompression is often that the eye go inside. So uh, the deviation was too large for prism. So she got occlusion of the right eye. And uh, what's important after orbital decompression is that they do uh, exercises in eye movement. That's very important. So she had to do the exercises. And of course, they get um, uh, corticotherapy. Four months after the orbital decompression, you see that the ESO deviation even increased. Um, the limitation of the abid, uh, abduction was also worse. Um, so um, she, she was directly, well, prisms are not uh, possible. So here you can only do occlusion and go till uh, she's ready for surgery. We mostly wait four months after orbital decompression to continue with surgery on the eye muscles um, till we don't see any more increase of the deviation. So at that stage, she got, um, five millimeter recession of both medial rectus muscles and a two millimeter loop recession on the uh, inferior rectus muscle of the right eye to, um, to correct her left hypertropia and the limitation of um, elevation in abduction. So this is, uh, I think, yeah, this is how she looks now. Um, she's still good, eh? Um, now, this is five year post surgery. She's, it's longer ago that she was at the operation. But uh, so she only has uh, horizontal diplopia in left case, as you can see here. So she still has the limitation of abduction, the overaction on the other eye. So if she looks to the other side, it's good. She has a small uh, isophoria, which she can compensate, but. Uh, I have given uh, prisms for both eyes, three prism diopters base out for driving because this is in our room, which is not on the road. And um, if you correct the, 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 the horizontal deviation in primary position, then her, she will have less diplopia on left gaze. And then she was uh, in for um, strabismus surgery. And I think I will end with this patient for the first uh, lesson on diplopia. Are there any uh, questions? Um, can I ask you that word? It was by accident. Uh, can I ask about that woman, that woman with the graves? Yes. Um, I see that there is a progressive uh, increase in the deviation after the surgery. After yes. the, so is it something that's expected or is it because of the occlusion? 
no, 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 no. Expected. No, if you do orbital decompression, um, you have to warn the patient that mostly uh, they will have an increase of their ESO deviation. Okay, we, and we, we see, sorry, we see, we have a, a grave clinic and we see like about eight patients uh, a week with thyroid eye disease. And if they need orbital surgery, so orbital decompression, those who have limited eye movement before the orbital decompression, they get worse after the decompression. My um, experience is that the elevation often improves, but the abduction uh, decreases. So you have to warn the patients for that. Thank you. And about the guy with the motorcycle accident, Yes. Uh, he also got worse after the reconstruction surgery. And uh, I would expect that he would get better, his deviation. And you, I think I, I remember you said it got worse. Uh, well, here, here he had the reconstruction. And then, yes, it, but also think about he got, it was one week after the reconstruction. So everything is still swollen Swollen. and that's why it it the the movements were were worse okay thank you it's a wonderful lecture daisy i i enjoyed it greatly thank you thank you no more questions it was very clear <laughs> and it should coherent. Be. It should be. Shall we move on to the next one? Yes, please. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, wait, I have to. You see it? Okay. So, uh, not yet. No? We see the the desktop uh, oh. the files, but not the presentation. Oh, that's strange because I see it here. Maybe you need to, yeah, do it again. Perhaps you should first open it and then just share it. Uh, I think. I have I don't see the zoom now. Uh. Okay, share screen. Uh. Yeah, it works. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I have to open first the part. The the first lecture I opened already. So. Uh, Okay, good. Uh, so we, we continue with diplopia and um, we in neurodegenerative diseases. So I will share with you three patients, uh, Walter, Bernard and Joanna. Um, Walter is, um, he has Parkinson disease. So what's Parkinson disease? Well, it's a progressive neurodegenerative disorder characterized by disruption of dopaminergic pathways. 
It's defined by its motive features like resting tremor, uh, brachykinesia, rigidity, and postural instability, but also many non-motor disorders like loss of smell, uh, rapid eye movement behavior disorder, mood disorders, um, hypotension, and neuropsychiatric disturbances as sleep disturbances, weight or gain loss, loss of energy, depression, fear, cogni cogn cognitive uh, issues uh, such as memory difficulties, slow thinking, confusion, dementia. But what about the ophthalmic changes in uh, Parkinson disease. Well, we see that patients have a decreased visual acuity, decreased co color vision and contrast sensitivity. They may complain of ghosting, fatigue, dry eyes, blepharitis, ocular irritation and visual hallucinations. Uh, binocular vision problems we see in, a lot in Parkinson's disease, uh, mostly convergence insufficiency, horizontal diplopia, abnormal and slow saccades, and saccadic smooth pursuit movements. Um, the complaints of patients are mostly blurred vision, double vision, near distance difficulties, nystagmus, or something is not quite right with the vision. So the first patient I want to share with you is, is Walter. He's um, 66 years of age and he has Parkinson disease since 2010. And he complains of horizontal diplopia at distance and near. He also has visual hallucinations. Uh, he drives a bike. He cannot drive his car anymore and he has difficulties with his multifocal glasses, which were 125 with an addition of two and a half. His vision is okay. Uh, with a little bit more hypermetropia, he has better vision. He reads quite well, and he has normal eye findings, normal uh, ocular pressure. Uh, the orthoptic examination. So we see an intermittent exotropia of the right eye of uh, 12 uh, near and 10 distance. Um, with Maddox rot, it's uh, a little bit larger at near the same at distance. Um, his fusion range is quite small, as you can see here. And um, he has um, no limitation of his ocular movement. His smooth pursuit movement is normal. His Saccades are very slow, which means if you, I say, look to my nose, look here, nose right, nose right, and the nose left, nose left, and the nose up and nose down. And it's very slow before he looks to the right and to the left, and up and down. He has no nystagmus, but his convergence is reduced till 50 centimeters. As you know, we, we don't read at 50 centimeters, we read at about 40, 30 centimeters. So this is why he also has this diplopia. If I put prisms in front, then at with four prism diopters base in both eyes, he can read till 15 centimeters. So then he has normal reading. So I did a trial for distance um, he has no diplopia if I put a uh, tree base in prisms in both eyes, he's happy. And near with four, he's happy too. So therapy, he gets uh, convergent exercises. Even if it's difficult for these patients, you always have to give them the exercise, the convergence exercises. So I do the push up. Uh, so they, they have to do it many times, not too long, otherwise they get tired. And then also the, the near distance. So look in the distance, look at near, look in the distance, look at near these exercises. And I do it very simple, not with, uh, with difficult things, just with, with a pencil, they have to, to do it. And I say just at home, you measure the first time you do your convergence. And then for example, you're at 50 and then every, 
four, three, four days, you measure again to see if there is any improvement. Convergence exercises, I always say, you always win. If you have one centimeter improvement, it's better. So, and also to do the exercises, you make anyway the, the convergence a little bit stronger, the muscle stronger. Another thing what's important for Parkinson patients is you have to give them blinking exercises because if you don't blink, you stare and patients, they stare. And if you stare, you don't focus and you don't put your eyes together. So if you, if you do it yourself and you look to one point without and you, you start staring, then often the latent deviation gets manifest. If you blink, you focus again and you put your eyes back together. So blinking it's, it, it is important for parking some patients. And then I, I took away his multifocal glasses and I gave him two pairs of glasses, one for reading and one for distance with prisms in, uh, in the glasses. And um, when he got back, he had no diplopia with the prism glasses. He did his exercises and so he was quite happy. And uh, so uh, he has, he had now, an in, well, he had this intermittent exotropia, which did not change a lot, but you don't expect that neither. It's not that you give glasses or exercises or prism that the deviation gets smaller. They can better control the deviation. And what, what we do see is that the fusion range was a little bit better. So if you compare it before treatment. Uh, the ocular movement was the same. His convergence was reduced to 40 centimeters, which was 10 centimeters improvement. So he had success. You cannot expect that it gets from, from, from 50 to, to zero. That's, 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 that's not realistic. And with his uh, four prism diopter glasses, he could now read till 10 centimeters, which was also a little bit better. So we just continued with his prism glasses and his convergence exercises. Then uh, a year later, when he came back, he had again intermittent typopia at near, but he did not do his exercises anymore. And you see that the fusion amplitude was worse. Uh, the eye position was the same. He <clears throat> and his convergence was again reduced to 50 centimeters. So what he had won, well, he lost again. And uh, and with his four prism, with his prism glasses, he could only read till 25 centimeters, which means that's your reading distance. So even with his prism glasses, he was having a difficulty and diplopia. So therapy, uh, his distant glasses were okay. Uh, start again with his convergence exercises. Again, better blinking and reading glasses. We changed them to five base in both eyes. Uh, I told him just first do your convergence exercises. If it's good, you don't have to change your glasses. If it's not enough, you have to change the glasses. And he did need to, to change the glasses. So you see in these patients with Parkinson the disease, how can we help? Uh, optical correction, no multifocal glasses because with their exo convergence problems, it's not working. So you give prisms for distance for near and or for distance, depending on the deviation. Really think the, the, about the blinking. Eye drops for the dry eyes, eh, because, because they don't blink enough, they stare a lot, they get dry eyes. Uh, convergence exercises, very important. Uh, education, I mean, you really have to, 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 to give them, on, you have to put them, put them on a regime. They have to do it. Uh, I always say, for example, before they eat, they have to do their exercises because otherwise it's evening and they have forgotten it. And if necessary, uh, this is the end, then you can always occlude one eye. Okay, well, if I look, I have quite a lot of um, patients with Parkinson's disease. And mostly they're all like having a little bit the same problems. It's all like the, 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 the smooth pursuit or the saccades. They are, they are slow 
uh, they all have, most of them, lots of them, they have convergence exercises, uh, convergence problems. Uh, they don't blink, they all have X. So, so it's, it's, it's all a little bit a mix of this. Then my other case is Bernard uh, with the spinocerebral ataxia. Uh, what is spinocerebral ataxia? Uh, it's also known as spinocerebellar uh, atrophy or spinocerebral degeneration. It has multiple types, each of which could be considered as a disease on its own. It's hereditary, it's progressive, it's degenerative degenerative and it's often fatal. Um, there is no known effective really treatment or cure. Uh, it can affect anyone at any age. Um, uh, it's either uh, recessive or dominant and um, you may carry it without knowing. Um, so the spinocerebellar ataxia type six it's characteristic, uh, characterized by a progressive problems with movement. Um, so initially they experience problems with coordination and balance. Um, and then they, um, they go to speech difficulties, uh, uh, the in, in, involuntary uh, eye movements like nystagmus and double facing. And they may also develop loss of coordination of their arms, streamers, and uncontrolled muscle tensing. Uh, so mostly they, they begin in a person type 6, uh, 40s or 50s, but it can uh, appear uh, any time from childhood to late adulthood. And uh, yeah, most of the people with this disorder require, require wheelchair assistance by the time they're about 60. And apparently it's in this region that uh, everything appears. Um, so this is Bernard. Um, this is when he, uh, at first consultation, uh, he complained of intermittent diplopia, oblique diplopia at distance since already seven years, and he had problems with speaking and walking, vertigo, and he also used multifocal glasses. Um, so there was an MRI cortical atrophy, and at that time he had uh, the suspect of spinocerebral ataxia. He had good vision with his myopic correction, uh, a little bit less at near with his uh, addition, and normal anterior and posterior segment. Um, when I examined him, <clears throat> I found a small exophoria uh, at near with a mild downbeat nystagmus and a small esophoria at distance with the same uh, downbeat nystagmus. Here he, oh, he had four prism dioptis exophoria at near and two at distance. Maddox rot was the same, no vertical deviation at near and a really very small deviation at distance. These very small vertical deviations we don't see with, with our eyes. So if, if a patient complains of any vertical uh, diplopia, you have to check with Maddox. Um, the fusion amplitude, as you can see, was very small, especially at uh, distance. Um, Synoptophore was better. Here he uh, had also a little bit of excited torsion. So if we look to his ocular movements, we don't see any limitation. A small right over uh, right um, hyper uh, in left case and left in right case. I don't know if you can see it here. You see the right over left and the left over right, but it's difficult to see. The smooth pursuit movements were full, the saccadic in lateral and vertical gaze. So he has saccadic small, uh, smooth pursuit movements. The saccades were full, but uh, he had, of course, his nystagmus. And in primary position, he had a downbeat nystagmus, which increased looking down, decreased, uh, get, got better looking up. And in a lateral gaze, 
he had his downbeat nystagmus plus a gaze evoked nystagmus in lateral gaze, which gives him an oblique nystagmus. Convergence in his case was good. So at the trial uh, with uh, prisms, at four distance, he had no uh, diplopia with uh, a 0 0.5 vertical prism and three base out. And we measured uh, two at uh, distance with Maddox three. So um, with three, he was the best. And uh, at near, he was better without presence. So I got him two pairs of glasses, one for four, with his myopic correction. And uh, um, I didn't give him oblique prism because it was not so, so much. So I, he got three base out uh, on the left eye and 0 0.5 base down on the right eye. And his near glasses, uh, Need, didn't need prisms. Uh, so I told him, or no glasses, or these ones, because without glasses, he can also read. So last consultation, eight years later, he was quite happy. Occasionally, intermittent diplopia at distance with his prism glasses, but he got more problems, of course, with speaking and walking. He was now in a wheelchair and uh, and since 2010, the confirmation of uh, spinocerebellar ataxia type 6 was, was done after the genetic test. He's a very nice and educated man. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's not, 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 well, it's a pity. Uh, he has good vision with his uh, myopic correction, distance and near. Um, and what we did see eight years later, he still has his small exophoria at near and his uh, isophoria at distance, which is now two prism diopters more, still the downbeat nystagmus, um, and still a little bit of excyclotorsion, the synoptophore. And now he had a partial gaze, gaze palsy uh, in, what is it? in up gaze. And he also had uh, his smooth pursuit were full, but saccadic in lateral gaze and down gaze and limited in up gaze. And the same with his saccades. So in horizontal and down gaze, they were still full, but again, limited in up gaze. And the nystagmus was the same. So we... Uh, we start. We we uh, we continued with his. I uh, know. Oh I changed his glasses for distance. Sorry, he got now two two, so four in totally base out in his distance glasses, and for near he didn't need any glasses, so he was quite happy with prisms. Just an example again that with prism in these patients with neurodegenerative uh, problems, we as orthoptists have a role. I don't know why I have these stripes here, but anyway. Then my third and last patient is Joanna, who has a PSP, a progressive supranuclear palsy. Um, uh, it's an uncommon brain disorder that affects movement, control of walking, balance, speech, swallowing, vision, mood, and behavior and thinking. Uh, it results from damage to the nerve cells in the brain. And uh, it's, it's always uh, bad uh, ends. Um, so these uh, nuclei, they, they are... Um, affected, they particularly control eye movement. Uh, it's one of the classic signs of the disease is an ability to aim and to move the eyes properly, which individuals may experience as blurring or as diplopia. So this is Joanna, she's 80. So she's quite old for having this disease already. Luckily, my aunt just uh, died at 70 uh, on the same disease. Um, and she complained of horizontal diplopia at near and intermittent horizontal diplopia at near and permanent oblique diplopia at distance since a few years. She closes her right eyes. She has problems with speaking, writing and walking. She falls often and she only has reading glasses since her cataract operation six months ago. 
and she has BSB since 2005. So when I saw her, it was already seven years. She has quite good vision with almost no um, refractive error. Um, reading glasses, of course, are needed. <clears throat> Um, in primary position, she has an exophoria with a mild jerk nystagmus to the left. And at distance, she has an isotropia of her right eye with a mild jerk nystagmus also to the left. So the nystagmus doesn't change. And here you see at near 10 prism diopters of exophoria, no vertical deviation, and at distance 6 uh, ET and no vertical deviation. Uh, as you see, I'm a fan of Maddox, so at near uh, the deviation is a little bit, is quite the same, and at distance it's also the same. So it's normal that you find like one, two prism diopters extra when you put the Maddox rod, but this is very surprisingly, I don't see any vertical movement, and she says that she has a six uh, prism diopters vertical deviation with Maddox. Um, if we measure fusion, because I found this, I also do vertical fusion, and you see that she has, uh, at near, she has a quite large vertical fusion, and at distance, I have only single vision with the six uh, prism diopters, and then one prism diopters uh, on, on both sides. So from six at seven, she sees double, and on five, she has double vision. In the synopter four, I do see no de vertical deviation. On the other hand, when we measure the subjective angle, she again gives, uh, shows um, an angle of three degrees, which is six prism diopters, but no circular cyclo deviation. If we look to our ocular movements, there are no li uh, limitation in lateral gaze, uh, but there is no vertical movement. Uh, smooth pursuit, uh, it's saccadic in lateral gaze, more to the left and to the right, and absent in vertical gaze. So she has a total vertical gaze palsy. And the saccades, they are horizontal, they are hypometric, more pronounced to the left, and vertical, they're absent in up gaze and a little bit in down gaze. <coughs> and she has a jerk nystagmus increasing in lateral gaze and upbeat nystagmus in up gaze and a downbeat nystagmus in um, down gaze. And she also has a reduced convergence of uh, 25 centimeters. So, at distance, she has no vertical deviation with the cover test, but she has a six uh, hypertropia, right hypertropia with Maddox. So if I try to correct the double vision with prisms, I need six by uh, eight prisms base out uh, and six base up for to correct the vertical deviation and this to correct the horizontal deviation. So if I put this in a factor, so I have six base up, up and eight base out, then I come to um, a prism, an oblique prism of 10, 35 degrees, which I can divide in five, five for each eye. And then she has a uh, single vision. So I put it in a frame. I put the five in oblique directions and I see if the patient sees double. If the patient doesn't see double, then you can all, always adjust a little bit. At near, she has no vertical deviation with Maddox. She has no diplopia with uh, four base in, in both eyes. And then she, has re she can read at 25 uh, to 30 centimeters. So therapy, we give her glasses for four with the oblique prisms and for near with the base in prisms. When we see her back, she has no diplopia at distance with these oblique prism glasses, so she's very happy. And she sometimes has diplopia at near when she's tired. Uh, if we look to the orthoptic examination, uh, uh, she still has the same measurements as uh, before. So that's all the same. And the, um, the only thing is that the saccades, which were a little bit present in looking down, they are now completely uh, absent. 
and her convergence is a little bit worse. Why did I do, did I do convergence exercises? I don't know. Um, so here, uh, there is no diplopia with her own prism glasses at distance and at near. She's better if I give her a little bit more. So I change the glasses on the left side instead of four base in, she gets five base in and then she's back happy. And I think, uh, so to take home message, how can we help these patients with neurodegenerative de diseases? Well, uh, first of all, give them convergence exercises, even if they're old, even if you know that it will not give you a good result. Uh, if you gain one centimeter, it's better than nothing. And also you do, you train something and often, psychologically it works because if the patient has a problem and you let do the patient something it 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 helps also advice about head and body position blinking is is important artificial tears especially in the parkinson patients glasses bifocal glasses but mostly two pairs of glasses multifocal glasses they are not really um good for them prisms because you often you need prisms different for near and distance so that's why you need these two pairs of glasses and don't forget to check your vertical deviation with your maddox rod when you have any case palsy um, and i'm a little bit out of my time i see thank you this was the last one any questions uh, no, we, we do the questions later on. Uh, I just have a one question. What do you tell them exactly about the blinking? What do you... Yeah, say? well, I, I tell them that they really have to blink, but really to put the eyes together. That, so they sometimes those patients who have a watch with where they can put an alarm like every hour, I said, put the alarm and then every time you, you start blinking and it just, yeah, they, they have to be aware that they have to do it. That's it. It's, it's not that a special exercise. Uh, and I also say to the, 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 the husband, the wife, or the one who comes with, with, with the patient that they have to say it to the nurses or to the uh, the patients who care for the people because often they're in homes already that they have to say every time they go for dinner or they bring something don't forget the blinking and I often sometimes I say so put it on a on, on a paper uh, in front of your television that you see put on blinking that you remember that you have to blink really that uh, Wonderful. Well, I'm going to try to uh, put the other on it. Um, show. You see it? Yes? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, right. Is it not too boring to have somebody talking the whole time, the same person? No, no. <laughs> Very interesting. Well, anyway, we have a break after this. Well, um, this is a little bit my, my favorite, uh, age-related distance isotropia. I've done a lot of uh, research in that. I've uh, made two publications about it. And uh, it's, uh, it's something we see so much, but uh, well, now we know it, but uh, years ago, we were not really aware about the age-related distance isotropia. I, as an orthoptist, I didn't, uh, learned about it in my time 40 years ago it didn't exist the the, the this type of of isotropia 
So what is uh, age-related distance isotropia? It's a condition characterized by a small acquired isodeviation with permanent or intermittent horizontal diplopia at far distance. At near, patients may have exophoria, orthophoria, or isophoria, but normally no complaints of double vision. It's observed in healthy individuals, usually over the age of 60, and it's not associated with lateral rectus muscle underaction, nor with any currently known neurological pathology. And it's also defined as primary divergence insufficiency isotropia in the other, older, older adult, or also it's part of the and, and it's part of the sagging eye syndrome. Um, so um, this study was done to I wanted to evaluate the long term progression of uh, age related distance isotropia. And uh, I wanted to know the evolution of the horizontal deviation and of the fusion amplitudes uh, for distance and near. So uh, it was, it's a study that I did in 2017. Uh, I still see these patients and they are still on in a database. Uh, so perhaps in, uh, in a few years, I'm going to do the uh, long, long term, no, long, long term follow up perhaps. Uh, anyway, so this study is about for 31 patients uh, out of the 141 I had uh, with age-related distance isotropia with a follow-up from um, 60 to uh, 161 months uh, with an average of 80 months. And this is between 1999 and 2017. Uh, so you see that... Uh, these are the with um, five years follow up, and but I have some of them with very, very long follow up, as you can see. Uh, so the age of the patients was between 60, 40, no, 64 and 85 at first visit, and between 71 and 95 at last visit. Uh, more female than men. Um, normal uh, medical history, none of the patients had any neurological disorder. As normal for this age group, patients had or cataract, a few of them, or where the most of them were pseudophagic, which is also normal for this age group. Uh, the refraction was quite okay. So the majority was in between emetropia plus one, and minus one. So we had only one patient with a little bit of higher, uh, uh, one, one, one eye of higher myopia and two eyes of higher hypermetropia. Visual acuity was quite good. Majority had very good, very good visual acuity. Some had a little bit less and only two eyes had uh, a visual acuity of uh, 0.5. So to be included in the study, there had to be at least a five prism diopter difference between the deviation and distance and near. The onset of the diplopia had to be uh, uh, over the age of 60. Uh, the abduction had to be completely normal and the patients uh, could not have suppression. Um, so any patient with a history of childhood strabismus, of previous strabismus surgery, of a coexisting vertical strabismus of cranial nerve palsy, supranuclear palsy, orbital trauma, thyroid eye disease, or myasthenia were excluded. So all normal patients. What did we measure? We measured the eye position at 30, at, at near 30 centimeters, at distance and at far distance. We measured the fusion amplitude with the prism bar at distance and near. And we, uh, um, um, the, the, the measurements were noted at first visit and uh, the first and the last visits uh, measurements were compared. 
if we look to the horizontal deviation at near, then in pink, it's uh, at first visit, in purple at last visit, then you see that we have a mix of everything. So we have here, that's orthophoria, we have exophoria and we have esophoria. Uh, what you can see is, in here you see it better. So this is, uh, at first visit, and this the, the purple is at last visit, you see that there is an increase of the ESO deviation at near by time. This is quite uh, obvious. And it's, uh, it is statistically uh, significant that there is increase in the horizontal deviation, the ESO drift at, uh, at near two um, in time. If we look at the distance uh, ESO deviation, then you see that we all have an ESO, an ESO deviation. There is no exo out, of course, because it's about ESO deviation. And you see that the, uh, the, the dark blue, the deviation is larger. Here you see it better. So this was at first visit. And then you see that at last visit, that the deviation uh, increased. And again, uh, it's uh, statistically significant, the increase of ESO deviation by time. Here I have four patients with a very long follow-up. Um, here it's from uh, 10 years of follow-up, started with two prism diopters, and then you see that uh, in uh, one year the same, and then in four years it goes up, it stays the same again, and then it goes up a little bit. So in 10 years, the ESO deviation and distance goes from two till 10 prism diopter, which, which is not a lot in 10 years, but it is slowly progressive. The same here, this is in 12 years, and it goes from six to 14. This is also in 12 years, it goes from four to 20, here a little bit more. Here in uh, 13 years, from 10 till about 18, so not so much anymore. So here you see you have an increase of your ESO deviation, but it's slowly progressive as people uh, become older. Then I look to the uh, fusion amplitude. Here you have the divergent fusion amplitude at near, uh, in uh, before and after the deviation, uh, sorry, before uh, at first visit and at last visit. And here you see that in some it's the same, sometimes it's a little bit better, it's a little bit worse. But anyway, if we put it in a box plot, we see that there is no uh, significant difference. So fusion amplitude, divergence fusion amplitude at near, there is no difference in time. The convergence fusion amplitude at near, you see it's much better than the divergence fusion amplitude. And again, some's a little bit better, sometimes a little bit worse. And again, here there is no significant difference difference. And we know if we measure fusion, then one day you have 20, the next day you have 16, but there is not an, uh, a significant difference. Then we have the divergence fusion amplitude at distance, and you see that it's really very small, uh, but in everybody, your divergence fusion amplitude at distance is small. It's about six, eight prism diopters. And here you see um, in some, again, it's better, it's worse. But again, you can see it here in the box plot. There is not a significant difference in the, diff in the fusion uh, amplitude at distance over time. And the same with the convergence amplitude at distance, you see it's better than the divergence fusion amplitude. You see it's also worse than at near. And again, there was not a significant difference over time <clears throat> for the convergence fusion amplitude at distance. 
So the horizontal motility, so horizontal ductions and versions were all full in all patients. None of the patients had lateral rectus muscle overaction. The abduction measured in the synoptophore was more than 30 degrees in all patients. Uh, what we see with these older patients, especially the 80 plus patient, that um, your, your motility is a little bit less than it was when you were young, but it's not that that's that. it's not a palsy or a real limitation. Uh, so they still can abduct to 30 degrees. Um, so and uh, the alternate present double test at distance in lateral gaze did not change the aviation with more than four prism diopters. So I mean, I measure the at distance in primary position, and then the patient has to look to the right and to the left, and I measure again. And mostly you see a little bit of increase of your vertical, uh, of your horizontal deviation, but not more than four prism diopters uh, looking to the right or looking to the left. And convergence was also normal in all these patients. We had no Parkinson or degenerative patients in this group. So patients were successfully treated with prisms. Um, in 23 patients, the prism correction increased over the years. In eight, it remained the same. If we treat the patients with prisms, uh, it's important. So you measure it in your room at six meters and you correct your uh, horizontal deviation with prisms. And then I go with the patients uh, outside the room because I don't have a window in my room. If you have a window in your room, you put the prism correction in the frame or you hold it in with your prism bar and you let the patient look at really far distance to see if there is still single vision. And also then the patient has to look to the right and to the left. And mostly you have to increase your prism with two, sometimes four prism diopters when you look at far distance and to the left and to the right. When, when, if these patients are driving a car, they also have to look to the right and to the left. And you have to be sure that the prisms you prescribe, they are enough for very long, far distance. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and then, so uh, most of these patients were given first now prisms in front of the non-dominant eye, which were later incorporated in the prism glasses. Uh, it depends if the patient has no glasses when he comes, then I immediately start with, uh, um, with prism glasses. If they have glasses, I start with the Fresnel prism. That's also because in Belgium, Fresnel prism, they are paid back by the, the, the social security. And um, uh, in corporate prisms, they are not paid back. So that's why we are easy using Fresnel prisms. Uh, only three patients of this group uh, needed strabismus surgery because they had quite a large uh, isotropia. Uh, but most of them, they have a small angle of deviation. They're, they, they, they are satisfied with their prism glasses. They have to wear glasses anyway, so it doesn't matter if they have to put a prism in it. And because of their age, probably, they're not like uh, very uh, happy to, to have an operation. Um, also, the distance ISO deviation did not change after cataract surgery. So those patients who have an uh, age-related distance isotropia, they need cataract surgery. Uh, mostly the cataract surgeon, they put the patient on zero, so they don't have to wear glasses at distance, but you have to, to wear this, to, to say to the patients that also after the cataract operation, they will need prism glasses for distance fixation. And so, because uh, the, the, the ophthalmologist uh, often don't think about the, the, the eye position and then they say, yeah, we can make you, that you get rid of your glasses, but they still see double after cataract surgery. So um, when I, I, I um, published this study, it was the first uh, to our knowledge to report about the long-term evolution of age-related distance isotropia and about fusional amplitudes in a large elderly cohort. 
Um, in the beginning, we diagnosed uh, age-related uh, distance isotropia as a mild sixth nerve palsy or as a compensation of a distance isophoria. That was at the time that we were not aware of this uh, type of isotropia. Um, this is like uh, 20 years ago. Um, since 2008, we started to, I started to record the data of elderly patients. And then since uh, then, I have recorded 141. Till March, now I have much more, of course. Um, in 2013, I published my first uh, data on this uh, subject, and we published about 87 patients, and I discussed uh, possible etiologies. And at that time, we compared fusional divergence amplitude to an age-matched control group of 56 elderly controls. Uh, without distance iso deviation, and I found a smaller divergent fusion amplitude in the um, in our study group than in the control group. So apparently, because not all patients who get an iso at distance they see double, it depends on your divergent fusion amplitude. So if you have like an eight prism diopter isotropia at distance, and you only have four prism diopters of range of divergence fusion amplitude, of course you see double. And so apparently in the first study we did, and we compared the, the, the study group with the control group, we found smaller divergence fusion amplitudes in the study group. So at that time in 2013, we had only six patients with a follow-up of more than five years. And then we observed an increase in distance isotropia and a decrease in their fusional amplitude over time. In this study with a much larger cohort, we still have that a statistically significant increase in the distance isotropia, but we don't have a significant decrease in the fusion and amplitudes. So what I that we thought in 2012, but only with six, six patients, we thought uh, uh, your ESO increases by in time and your fusion decreases. Apparently with a larger study group, we didn't find that. What we also observed is that the deviation especially increased after seven years, but the population of this study is too small to, to conclude, make any conclusion about this observation. So that's why I'm going to continue with this uh, research and have a larger group with a larger follow-up, hopefully, I hope in the next years. So uh, what we also saw that at near the deviation shifts to convergence by aging, and so your, your, your deviation at distance increases, and of course your exo decreases and your isophoria increases. No vertical deviation developed during the follow-up uh, period. So apparently if your patient has a horizontal deviation, it stays horizontal. So we didn't find any significant change in fusional amplitude at distance and near fusion, divergence fusional amplitude was present in all our patients, but not large enough to correct the slowly progressive isodevia at distance. So it's not that they have a really divergent uh, insufficiency fusion, it's because you're ESO gets larger and you just have a, a smaller divergent fusion that it's not enough to correct your um, ESO deviation that gets larger. So patients who had larger divergent fusional amplitude complained initially about intermittent horizontal diplopia, more pronounced on lateral gaze and only at very far distance. Yeah, those who had a smaller then the, they have it, for example, already when they look television. And as the ESO deviation progresses over time, the point at which the horizontal diplopia occurs comes closer, which is evidence, and which may even result when it gets more and more and more at diplopia at near. 
Also, the et etiology of age-related distant isotropia is not clear. It's likely secondary to evolutional evolutional changes within the orbit, most notably sagging and inferior displacement of the rectus, uh, the lateral rectus muscles and its pulleys caused by tendon laxity because of degeneration as patients get older. And so what I always explain to the patients so they can understand it, I always say, hey, you're, you're your muscles by age, they get uh, less stronger. And because your lateral rectus is longer than your medial rectus, so a muscle who is longer than the, the shorter mus muscle, they stay stronger than the longer muscle. And that's why your eye go inside. And that's only also when you look to one side, then the lateral muscle cannot pull as much as the medial rectus muscle. So your ESO is a little bit more in lateral gaze. And in that way, the patient explains, uh, understands also what, what his problem is. So sagging and bilateral symmetrical downward displacement of the lateral rectus pulleys may symmetrically reduce the production. And that's what you also see that your elevation in older patients gets less and may cause either deviation and horizontal diplopia distance. If you have a bilaterally asymmetrical lateral rectus sag, then you will have a horizontal, a vertical and cyclo a deviation um, of the eye with a greater sac. And this caused then cyclovertical diplopia. So I also believe that your age-related distance isotropia is part of the sagging eye syndrome and that due to age, the longer lateral rectus muscle weakens to a greater extent compared to the shorter medial rectus muscle, which result in a slowly progressive iso drift for distance and at a later stage also for near. And then apparently once the sagging is symmetrically, it remains uh, symmetrically because none of our 31 patients developed a vertical deviation over time. And then about the name of the deviation, um, and so adults, so age-related distance isotropia was suggested by David Middleman in 2006. And I think that's the correct name. Um, that we confirm also that the remark of divergence insufficiency isotropia is less accurate because it, this condition doesn't say anything about the aging of the patients. And the divergence, uh, it's not really reduced. So um, I hope we can stick with the name uh, age-related distance isotropia. Thank you. And these are the two uh, publications if you're interested to read them. I'm happy to send them if you need it. Thank you. It was an excellent uh, lecture. Uh, we are going to have a, a short break. Uh, for 15 minutes, mm -hmm. so everyone come back. Uh, we will meet again at uh, 11.15 uh, Israeli time. Israel I think time. there is uh, one question, uh, Doron. Second. Hi. Uh, thank you. Uh, first, I want to thank you for the very interesting lecture that uh, spread light of something that we see in clinic and not everybody has the time and patience to put attention to it and to collect so many patients and to make order in what we see. Uh, I want to talk about the, to ask you about the connection to the second eye syndrome. Now, Dr. Dimmer, one of his main uh, ideas is to uh, explain a vergence and uh, micro corrections of eye movement by the, all this uh, concept of uh, pulleys and, uh, and, um, and intermuscular membranes. And uh, I think that what you showed here very nicely and uh, go with the hand, hand to hand is that uh, it also can influence vergence the fusions ranges, not only cause esotropia. 
And maybe if we'll go further into that and we'll think about the specific term of the orbital layer of the lateral rectus in uh, put, putting the pull in place. And when this get weakens, we get this syndrome, not only because the muscle get, uh, it's the no, muscle yeah. that, it, the muscle just gets weaker, but it, because if it gets weaker, it's not not pulling the eye, but it's not pulling the pull it in a, the way it uh, used to do. And we have to start thinking in this ways, I think. Yeah, correct. Uh, the only thing is what I say, it's how I explain it to the patients because with pulleys, well, I don't start <laughs> to explain pulleys to patients. So it just, uh, they, they see double, they think often patients, if they see double, then they think they have brain problems. So I say, look, it's it's very benign. It's, it's not a, a dangerous condition. It's something that's because of your age. And then I just say, it's because these muscles get weaker. It, it's the way I say it to the patients, okay. but it's correct. It's of course, the reason are the pulleys and uh, I, I, uh, we, we agree completely that it's, it, this is part of the sagging eye syndrome, what Diemer uh, very nice described, correct. But it's a very good way to explain your patients. Maybe we'll try this with the residents also, because they also find police very difficult to understand. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank hey, you. Laura, did you want to ask something? Uh, yes. Uh, I'd like to ask a question on uh, behalf of one of my uh, colleagues. Uh, first of all, thank you for all of your outstanding um, lectures this morning. Uh, the question is, uh, uh, in your experience, these patients uh, that will get cataract surgery just on one eye, will it, would it change the diplopia or... Um, this is the first question. And the second question is, uh, if the surgery is recommended or is um, not recommended, I, I spoke about the um, cataract surgery on one eye um, for this kind of patients. I don't think it's, it, it makes any difference. Uh, if they have cataract, they need to be operated because if you have cataract on one eye, um, and so this that eye sees less than the other eye, it, it gets your problems with fusion. So I think it's better to, to operate the cataract. Uh, the For better sure. the fusion, the, the, the better the vision is, the better you can cope with, uh, with uh, you, you have better uh, fusion. The only thing is what I, I, I just wanted to say is that it's not because they do a cataract operation that the diplopia will go away because patients often they think if they do the operation, then everything will be okay. And that's not because your, your eye position doesn't change when you uh, remove the cataract, if it's one or both eyes. I, I okay. Um, I, I think that uh, I, I, I think that the question was because of the change of the balance that there is uh, no, the sensory no. balance that there is between the two eyes. Is there um, perhaps in your experience did you see a change in the diplopia with this kind of patient? I think if one eye sees less than the other. Uh, it will be more difficult to fuse. So perhaps they have more complaints of diplopia. So when you correct the, the vision and they can better fuse again, then it will give less diplopia unless the deviation is too large for fusion. So sure. it, it depends on how large the deviation is and how good your fusion is, of course. But I think... Uh, if I would see patient with uh, this type of, of isotropia with cataract, uh, I would never, uh, I, I would always suggest to do the cataract operation because the better you see, the better you can cope with your vision. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we will take a 15 minutes break and we will meet at 11.20 Israel time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Younger. Okay, we are going to start. So uh, we keep the, the, the question for later. later. Yes. Okay, I start. Yes, please. Okay. 
So uh, this is um, a lesson about what we can all do with prisms. Uh, it's quite basic. Uh, it's really very basic. It's level. It's really student level. Uh, some of the the slides you will have seen before, uh, but I know that um, to repeat something, uh, it doesn't. It it's it's not not a problem. Okay, so um, we can use prisms for a lot of things in ophthalmology, especially in uh, in orthoptics. And the first thing we use prisms for, I already show you that, is to measure the angle of the deviation. And this is like a repetition a little bit. I, I'm not going to, I will go fast through it. So the prism reflection test or a Krimsky test is uh, <clears throat> an, um, a measure. Uh, this, so the, the, we first measure the deviation with the Hirschberg method. And we know that each millimeter of displacement of the corneal light reflex is about seven degrees or 15 prism diopters. So uh, we have uh, like zero on the center of the pupil, uh, 15 on the A on the, <clears throat> the border of the pupil, uh, in between the border of the pupil and the um, the limbus, it's about 25, and over the limbus, it can be to 48. And then we place um, <clears throat> a prism in front of the mostly the dominant eye to uh, measure the deviation of the deviated eye. Uh, if we measure an ESO deviation, we place the prism base out, an exo deviation base in, a high PO deviation base up, a hyper deviation uh, base <coughs> down. And but here you know that a hyper of one eye is a hypo of the left eye of the other eye. So you can choose of what you do. So the prism, the eye behind the prism moves to obtain fixation uh, due to the Herring's law and the squinting eye makes a conjugate movement and the prism strength is increased until the reflection matches that previously noted in the fixing eye. So here you see the light reflections on the limbus. So you increase your prisms in front of your straight eye until the reflex is in the middle of the pupil, as you can see here. Uh, I have showed you already with the first lecture that sometimes we do it in a different way, but this is like it's normally done. Um, so it's important to measure it at distance and near with and without glasses and with and without 30 colors, you can use it. So it's easy to do it for all patients with uh, nystagmus with uh, uh, uncomparative, um, difficult to examine uh, children, for example. Um, it's, uh, it's a useful thing, but it's an estimation. You really don't measure your deviation. Then, uh, well, I already said that, um, you can use the prism for your prism and cover test, which I already said, it's the method of choice to measure the objective angle of deviation and you always do it after your alternate cover test and here um, you um, <clears throat> increase your prism strength until you don't see any movement anymore so i suppose that the prism cover test it's all uh, known by everybody of you uh, if i give this lecture to ophthalmologists then sometimes I really have to explain it. So you do your alternate cover test, you see a movement of the eye and you increase your prism strength until you see no movement anymore. Um, and then <clears throat> if you have a, a horizontal and a vertical deviation, so first of all, you, for example, correct the horizontal deviation. If the horizontal deviation is correct, you will still see a vertical deviation and then you have to hold the prism. And as I already said in the first lecture, sometimes it's quite difficult if you have to put a lot of prisms in front of uh, the eye. What we also know is that if we have like, uh, sometimes you have 40 and then there is still movement. And if you 
use 30 and 15 together, then you have 45, for example, and then it's too much. Go you back, and then you go back to 40, and then it's enough. So we know that one prism on one eye is a little bit different than if you divide the prisms, but the, the difference is small, so it's not like um, a big issue. It's not like a 10 or 20 prism diopters difference. Mostly it's about maximum five prism diopters difference, but it's important that you are aware of it. And also, like I already said, if you have large deviation, large combined deviation, uh, it's more exactly to measure your ocular deviation in the synaptophore. Um, I already said this, we already discussed that you have to measure with right and left fixation at distance and near, with or without classes in case of accommodative isotropia, for example, with or without uh, abnormal head posture, on light and object fixation, especially in case of uh, accommodation problems. And we do it in patients with good fixation and good cooperation. Then another use of our prism is in combination with the Maddox rod. Uh, you know it's a subjective method to measure horizontal, vertical, and torsional deviations. And uh, you get complete dissociation of your eyes because one eye sees a line and the other eye sees a light. So that's why often the deviation is a little bit larger with Maddox than when you measure it yourself. And um, well, uh, you know that uh, if you hold the, the Maddox uh, horizontally, you see a vertical line in the middle of the light when there is no horizontal deviation, left and right if there is a horizontal deviation. And uh, when you hold your Maddox uh, vertically, you see a horizontal line. If we have it in the middle of the light with no vertical, deviation and above and below you have a vertical deviation and then you can use your uh, prism to correct or measure the deviation with Maddox. Uh, here she will have a horizontal line so you can hold your prism with base in or base out and then you have the subjective uh, angle of deviation. And the same with, uh, with the vertical deviation, you hold your prism uh, bar uh, in a vertical way till you have the line through the uh, light. And then you have your subjective vertical deviation. And sometimes it's important because then you have horizontal, you have with the APCT, you have measured in an objective way, and this is in a subjective way. And we have seen that in patients with vertical, um, uh, with gaze palsies that it is useful or it's the only way to measure your deviation. The prism adaptation test, I haven't spoken about that yet. Uh, the prism adaptation test, we mostly uh, do that in patients with uh, intermittent. Um, I do it mostly in intermittent exotropia and before a strabismus operation to measure your maximum uh, deviation of strabismus. In patients who have a manifest deviation, in my opinion, it doesn't give you any more information because they are already completely dissociated. So you have already the maximum angle, but those who have an intermittent or a latent deviation there, it's uh, very useful. Also, when you have the distance uh, or the exo intermittent exotropia with divergence excess, where the angle is larger at distance than at near, because at near patients can compensate, um, you can use your prism adaptation test to see if there is a true or simulated uh, accommodation um, uh, ACA ratio. So to how to do your prism adaptation test. So first you measure uh, the, um, the deviation with your alternate prism cover test. And then you put um, prisms, you, you, you give prisms to the patient. Here you see these are first now prisms uh, fixed on a frame. You can, can also do it with a normal frame you use for your uh, refraction and you put prisms inside it. And then you leave the patient outside for about 35, uh, 30, 45 minutes. 
and you measure the angle of deviation again. When your angle becomes greater than eight prism diopters, you put the correct amount of prisms again in the frame and the patient has to wait again till there is no increase of deviation anymore. And then it's important to know that if you correct the complete angle of deviation of the patient sees double yes or no, and then you know how much you can uh, operate on. Uh, if you have somebody with a deviation of, of um, 30 and with a uh, <clears throat> You, you, with 30, he has single vision, but after your prism adaptation test, you have 40, and with 40, there is uh, double vision, then you know that you have to correct the angle of 30 and not the angle of 40. Okay, so we know already that we can use prisms to measure the angle of deviation. We also use prism, prisms to measure binocular vision. And in Belgium and Holland, the 15 prism diopter test is used a lot. I know that in other countries they don't use it, but we use it as a screening, let's say, to see uh, if there is a peripheral motor fusion or ocular dominance. And the 15 prism diopter test is only done if with a light reflex, we have apparently straight eyes or if we have a patient with a microstrabismus. So first we, uh, <clears throat> we put the prism base out. And then if we put the prism base out, a patient with binocular vision has sees two lights. And when there is convergent motor fusion, you see a convergent fusion movement to have single vision again. Um, then you, hold the prism in front of the other eye and again you will see a uh, convergent motor movement of the eye behind the prism. So in this uh, little baby uh, it's especially useful in babies where you cannot do visual acuity measurements. So if you have this little baby uh, with apparently straight eyes and you do the prism cover, this prism test and you hold the prism in front of this left eye and you see that the left eye makes a movement to gain again binocular single vision, you know that fusion is present. You hold it for the other eye and again this eye moves inside and you know she has good uh, convergent motor fusion which means that uh, vision should be quite good and there will be no strabismus in a child that cannot say what it sees. Then we do the test with base out, and this is done. Um, yeah, um, this, yeah, ba sorry, base in, excuse me. So then we uh, repeat the test base in to demonstrate divergent motor fusion. Now, only patients with exophoria have a good divergent motor fusion to overcome 15 prism diopters. Most of us, yeah, we have with straight eyes, we have a good convergent motor fusion. We can easily overcome 15 prism diopters, but we cannot easily compensate 15 prism diopters divergent. So what do we see then? Well, uh, we will see that, uh, wait, uh, uh, okay, wait, uh, here, yeah. So here we will see that if we hold it uh, in front of the left eye, then we will see that both eyes move to the left. When you hold it in front of the right eye, you will see that both eyes move to the right, which means that both eyes, um, see that there, there is double vision, so you have an alternate dominance. If you have a child who has, uh, for example, one good eye and one bad eye, then you will see the movement. If you hold the prism in front of the good eye, both eyes go to the left. If you hold it in front of the bad eye, you will see no movement. So if we do the 50 prism diopter test and we see no movement, which means that there is no motor fusion and that the prism is held in front of the non-dominant. Yeah.
if we see the uh, conjugate movement of the eye, then me means that again, there is no more diffusion and that the prism is held in front of the dominant eye. So in little babies, it's very useful to do this test because then you immediately know which of these two eyes is dominant. Here you have no movement and on the right side you have movement. So this is the dominant eye and this is the non-dominant eye. This, this can be an eye with a very small strabismus, for example, or with a deep amblyopia or with a deep refraction error. Uh, but it's, it's an easy test. It's, it's a screening test to see is there fusion, yes or no? And if not, which eye is dominant? Then another test I use a lot is the biprism test. It's uh, the... It's a little bit the same, but it's done with a prism of four, six, or eight prism diopters. And you have, uh, it's, uh, it's two prism on top of it, base in, base out. And it's used to demonstrate foveal fusion or foveal suppression, eye dominance, or amblyopia. And here again, you hold the prism in front of each eye. Here, for example, you hold it in front of the left eye and you see a movement inside. Then you move the prism. And so here it's base in and then it's base out. And so base in, you see a movement inside. Base out, you see a movement outside. So in front of the left eye, you see movement. Then you hold the prism in front of the right eye and you see base out, a movement inside, base in, a movement outside. So here you know that this child has bifoveal fixation and there is no amblyopia because there is foveal fusion. On the other hand, if you see, if you hold it in front of the left eye and you see the movement of two eyes to the uh, right and base uh, in two eyes move to the left and you hold it in front of the right eye and there is no movement, then you know this eye is the dominant eye and probably there is an amblyopia of that eye. So before children can speak, you already know something about visual acuity. This prism, the biprism test, is uh, developed by uh, Dr. Grassis. He's an Italian uh, ophthalmologist. And he even uh, said, uh, unfortunately, he's, he, he died. But uh, when he was still alive, he said, uh, as long as you're B-prism test is not binocular positive, you still have amblyopia. So it's a very useful tool for to, to detect amblyopia, even after your uh, therapy to, uh, to see if your, your dominance is, uh, is okay. Yeah, and here, if you hold it, you see no movement in front of the left eye and movement in front of the right eye, then you know that the right eye is dominant and the left eye is uh, amblyopic. And then we use our prisms for measuring fusion or suppression. Uh, we know that fusion has two components, sensory fusion, the ability to appreciate two similar images, one for each eye, and to interpret them as one, and motor fusion, the ability to maintain single, a single fused image during virgence movements. So we will measure fusion amplitude in patients with straight eyes, in patients with microstrobismus, and in patients with diplopia to regain binocular single vision. And we also measure, I think it's important to measure your fusion amplitude before cataract refractive and macular surgery, before sometimes they do an operation. To measure the positive or convergence fusion amplitude, we hold our prism base, prism bar base out, and we increase the prism strength until the patient sees double. Um, to um, measure your negative fusion amplitudes, um, you wait. wait. Uh, your positive fusion amplitude, it's about 35, 40 at near, and it's about 15 to 20 at distance. Then the negative fusion amplitude or divergent fusion amplitude, you measure it with your base nasally, 
and until the patient sees double, and it's about 15 at near and five, seven at distant. So as you have seen with my formal lecture, our divergence fusion amplitude at distant is very small. So when our eyes are going inside, it's normal that we see double. Vertical, we use the vertical prism bar. And again, we hold the prism base down and base up until the patient sees double. And then we have the total vertical fusion amplitude, which is about six prism diopters for distance and near. We only see large vertical fusion amplitudes in case of congenital Ford nerve palsy, for example. We measure the suppression amplitude in patients with strabismus. For example, before an operation, it's very important to see if we correct this, that the patient is not going to see double. And in case of diplopia, we are going to use the prism bar to find the suppression scotoma again. And it's done the same way with the prism bars until the patient in this uh, when we measure the suppression range, we measure until the patient sees double uh, in both sides, horizontally and vertically, if necessary. So then uh, this is for diagnostic tools. Now in therapeutic use, we use it to overcome diplopia in normal binocular vision, for example. So we are going to restore diplopia uh, and restore normal binocular single vision. And this is done, for example, in patients with a decompensation of heterophorias. If we have a decompensated esophoria, we use base out prisms. In a decompensated exophoria, we use base in prisms. In a decompensated hyperphoria, we use vertical prism base up and base down. If you only have to um, use one vertical prism, I always prefer base up instead of base down because of the cheek, uh, your base is thicker and then it sometimes gives problem. And it's important always to give the smallest prism possible for fusion. Um, this is uh, an example, a um, uh, lady, fifth. 8 years of age with a near exophoria. You see the deviation is larger at near than at distance. Um, she has not so much uh, divergent fusion amplitude and um, she has a good convergence, but at near she has uh, we, we do a trial for her near vision and we see that she is much better if we give her small prisms in her reading glasses, two or three. And then I put the, the patient with, uh, with a, a frame, trial frame in the waiting room with her uh, reading uh, correction and then with the prism and then you can see if you need two or three and then you see if the patient is better with two and three and this for example patient was better if we put three base in round in prisms uh, my um, experience is that fresnel prisms on reading glasses it's they they they're never good uh, um, accepted. So I always give reading glasses immediately with ground in prisms. And the patient has to read outside with a trial frame. In patients with intermittent strabismus, it's the same uh, thing here. A patient with a distant isotropia, like we have seen before, for example, uh, two isophoria at near, eight at distance. And then you see that at distance, she needs four prism diopters before she has fusion. But at four distance, she needs six. So this means that you have to give her six in her uh, four distance glasses. So here I've tried first Fresnel. If they are good, they have no diplopia with Fresnel prism, then you can uh, give them ground in prisms and you divide the prism uh, deviation in, the, in both classes. Also prisms are useful in paralytic strabismus. Uh, for example, in a six nerve palsy, um, 
You can use it when you have a small to a moderate palsy. And if you correct the you have to correct the, the, the distance ease of deviation. So here I have an example. For example, uh, at near the patient has with right fixation, when the paretic eye is fixating, you see that the deviation is larger than when she fixates with the non paretic eye. And you see at distance, the deviation is larger than at near. And so she has a limitation of abduction of the right eye. And with the personnel of 15, uh, we, we do a trial, she has no diplopia. So in these patients, we always start with Fresnel prism because you know her uh, six nerve palsy can resolve and then she does not need prisms anymore. In a fourth nerve palsy, you can also um, often uh, I think vertical prisms are mostly used in uh, fourth nerve palsies. Here you have a patient with an uh, acquired fourth nerve palsy. You see it's not, uh, uh, you see the limitation of uh, the underaction of the superior oblique of the left eye. Um, and you see that the uh, left hypertropia is larger looking to the, <clears throat> the left, uh, right now, to the right, sorry. And uh, there is uh, 10 prism diopters of vertical deviation, but with six patient has no diplopia. So then you give six uh, Fresnel, and if the patient is good, we can divide uh, the prism power in uh, both classes, and you can give ground in prisms. Third nerve palsy, it's a difficult palsy to give prisms because often the deviation is too incompetent, but you can do it if the for residual deviations or if the deviation, the sixth nerve palsy um, gets an aberrant um, sixth nerve, uh, sorry, the third nerve palsy gets an aberrant third nerve palsy, then sometimes you can still use uh, prisms. Uh, this is a lady who has a congenital residual Finaf palsy. So in primary position, she has uh, only uh, a small exotropia. And she still has her limitation of adduction. And of course, she has a limitation of elevation and depression. But we can correct the deviation in primary position. So she has no uh, diplopia in primary position. So in this case, she had, she had no... Um, Diplopia with six base in uh, of base uh, nasally. And um, so uh, we have given uh, ground in prisms of three base in for both uh, eyes. Um, another patient with a traumatic convergence palsy. Um, he had uh, a working accident. He got uh, something on his head and he had a complete convergence and uh, accommodation palsy uh, or uh, accommodation insufficiency and a an, uh, convergence palsy. So at near, he had 16 prism diopters of exotropia. At one meter, it was eight and at distance, it was zero. So his fusion at uh, distance was okay, was uh, he was in the middle. At one meter, we needed eight to give him binocular single vision. And at near, he needed 14 to get binocular single vision. He had normal ocular mobility, but no, totally no convergence. Um, and he, uh, and as you can see here, his binocular vision was good without glasses at distance. And at near, it was reduced. Uh, because of his uh, reduced accommodation. So he got uh, bifocals. Uh, in the upper part, he had plano glasses. And in the uh, lower part, he had reading glasses plus two and a half and eight base uh, in, in both eyes to get rid of his double vision. This was the only way we could uh, um, treat him. Um, he was not happy with his bifocal glasses because he still had intermittent diplopia when he was uh, working. Yeah, for near, it was good. For distance, it was good, but intermediately not. So that's why we uh, 
uh, gave him trifocal glasses finally with for far distance plano here and then intermediately he had plus 125 with four base in both eyes and the uh, lower part he had two and a half with eight base nasally and um, I don't know how it's going with him because he didn't um, we lost him for follow-up Mechanical strabismus can be um, treated with prisms, uh, a blowout fracture. Um, that is the lady I showed you in the first lecture with the, the blowout fracture. And she was given, as I told you before, um, to correct the left hypertropia. She got two prisms based up in the right eye in the distant glasses. And for the right hyper. Tropia at near here, she got uh, four based up on the left side in the reading glasses. So that's also we can use prisms for. Thyroid eye disease, uh, often the deviation is too large to give prisms. Often you have to occlude one eye until the patient gets an operation, but sometimes you can still give prisms. Uh, for example, this is another lady uh, who had an orbital decompression. And after her orbital decompression, her eye went inside. So um, first of all, she had 14 ET at distance and she was uh, with um, eight, she could uh, manage her diplopia at distance. But as the deviation gets larger, if you wait longer, um, you see here that was uh, I think one month, and this was uh, three months after your orbital decompression, then she needed a stronger prism. So, but then Fresnel prisms are useful because you just can change the Fresnel prisms. This is another lady with thyroid eye disease where we can give prisms. And uh, that's something if you, I don't know if you have experience with thyroid eye patients, but often they have a very large vertical deviation. And still, you, you don't need so much prisms. So if you measure 20 vertical deviation, this doesn't mean that you need 20 prism diopters to give her binocular single vision. Mostly, patients with thyroid eye disease, when they have vertical deviation, it's when they look up, when they look down. It's a mechanical condition. Looking down, the deviation is much smaller, and they, they already are using their abnormal head posture. So you don't have to measure, you, you don't have to give the prisms when they look like this because they have the tendency to do this already, which means that the prism you prescribe for thyroid eye disease patients is much smaller than the deviation you measure. Um, this is an example, for example, of a patient with a hypotropia of the left eye. Uh, it's not so much. So in the beginning, he could be... Uh, helped with four and then when it goes um, when the deviation starts slowly and the the it gets worse very fast then they have difficulties to cope and then you need larger prisms when the deviation is very slowly progressive then they they really um, can cope quite good themselves. And often you see in these patients also quite large fusion amplitudes. But it depends how fast the, the disease, uh, the, the, evolution, the, the evolution of the disease is. And then finally, to overcome diplopia in supranuclear palsies, um, we, we, uh, uh, prisms can be useful. Uh, in gaze palsies, we can give yoke prisms, which means that the base of the prism is on the same side, yeah, and or to correct the deviation in primary position, as we have seen with the patient before, and also in patients with an intranuclear uh, ophthalmoplegia, a base in prism uh, can be useful. Patient has an um, limitation of adduction, but also has a little exo in primary position. So you can correct as much exo as you 
as a patient accept. And then she has less diplopia looking in the direction where she has the limitation of adduction and the abducting nystagmus. This is the, uh, an example from somebody with a gaze palsy. It's a little bit the same as I showed you before. So no vertical deviation when you do your measurement in an objective way. When you use Maddox to measure your subjective uh, angle of deviation, you see a large uh, vertical deviation um, due to the complete vertical gaze palsy. So in this patient, uh, you have to put prism in front of the eye until the, the patient has single vision. This is purely subjective. You just put and say, um, tell the patient to say when, it's, when, when you have single vision. In this way, you also first have to correct the horizontal and then the vertical deviation. And if you have then the total deviation, you can uh, calculate for an oblique prism because then the prism is less uh, thick and then you can, um, especially for when you prescribe crown in prisms, uh, in this first we, we start with a Fresnel and here you see that we need a Fresnel of 15 of 220 uh, degrees. If you have to if you can uh, cooperate the prism in the glasses, you will have only seven and a half on both sides, which is still doable. Um, we also can use prisms in patients with abnormal binocular vision. Um, so in case uh, we have a micro uh, strabismus, we know they often have abnormal retinal correspondence. So then, mm -hmm. And if they have a decompensation of a microstrobismus, then it's the abnormal single vision that we will restore. Uh, or if we have to restore uh, patients who have suppression, uh, it can be that patients with suppression are going to see double because of a surgical overcorrection. So they will, uh, the, the, the image with will fall beside their suppression scotoma, so they can have um, double vision. You see here, the lady had a hypertropia of the left eye, and after surgery, she had a hypertropia of the left eye. So uh, change in the direction of the deviation. Um, we know that isotropia, isotropia can drift to an exotropia by time. For example, this is a very a deep amblyopic eye and without doing anything, even an ESO can shift to an exotropia. And also we have can have a change in the magnitude of a deviation, like a small tropia becomes a larger one. This is, for example, an example of somebody who in the, where the isotropia increased. And here you see at near 18, at distance 16, um, the suppression at near is uh, from 6 till 18 uh, at, at far distance about the same. Um, and here you see that the angle of deviation is uh, out of the suppression range. You see, see, she has suppression from 0 till plus 8 and her deviation is larger than the suppression scotoma. So what you can do is you can give a prism, and in this way, the deviation is again into the suppression scotoma, and then the patient has no diplopia anymore. So also for these patients, prisms are um, useful. Another way um, therapeutic use of prisms is in nystagmus. Um, if we have restachmus, then uh, um, it's a slow movement away from the fovea, uh, followed with a correction movement that brings it back to the fovea. And we all know that normally a jerk nystagmus is faster when the patient looks in the direction of the fast face 
and less nystagmus when he looks out of the direction of the fast phase. So uh, these patients with a jerk nystagmus, they will have an abnormal head posture to put the eyes in the null zone or in the zone where there is less nystagmus. And what we can do uh, to uh, correct a little bit the abnormal head posture is to put prism in front of the eyes. So in this case, he has an, um, his slow zone is looking to the left. So you can put yoke prism, so based to the same side, based to the right, to put the eyes to the left, and then the patient has not to move his head himself. You can also do it when you have a null zone looking down. You can give prism base up in both eyes, or when you have a null zone up, you can give prism base down. And those who have uh, an um, less nystagmus in convergence, you can give prisms base out on both eyes to obtain an artificial exotropia and to stimulate the fusion or convergence. And in this way, uh, he can have a better vision and less nystagmus. The only thing is it's mostly up to seven maximum prism base out that you can give. This is something that perhaps you're not familiar with. I do give prisms in Meniere disease. Um, uh, before you give the prism, you do an, uh, an uh, you do the Maddox rod. You measure your um, deviation. Mostly they have straight eyes, and you just measure a small uh, exophoria, for example. You do the Maddox rod also, and then you measure your fusion amplitude at distance and near, and then you do the extended Uter-Muller test. That's a test that is done in Meniere patients and it's used with an after image test and a light source. And how does it work, this extended Uter-Muller test? Well, the patient, you give the patient uh, a flash with both eyes open, then he has to close the eye and then they have to walk to the light. Right? So they have the after image and they walk to the after image. They walk to the after image and they walk back and they walk forward and backward. And patients with a miniere, they mostly deviate to one side. And then you put prisms in front of the eyes. So I start with one prism uh, uh, in front of the eye where the miniere disease is. And you uh, adapt your prism until the patient walks straight. Mostly, it's, uh, these are very, very small prism between 0 0.5 and 1.5. So the total pres uh, prescribed power never exceeds, exceeds two and a half, three prism diopters. And apparently, it's, it's not like, a, it's not really a scientific proven uh, method, but uh, a lot of um, Meniere patients, they have much less uh, problems with their vertigo and their dizziness and vomiting when they use these small prism glasses. And the idea is that in, in front of the eye with the Meniere, you put like, for example, one and a half prism diopters base in, and on the other side, 0 0.5 base in, and it gives quite good results. Um, so I've written here uh, a, a publication that is done by someone. Then uh, we can use prisms in low vision patients uh, for eccentric viewing. In selected patients with long-standing absolute central scotoma, and there the prisms are used to relocate the image away from the damaged fovea to the preferred uh, retinal locus. You know that prisms with macular holes or macular degeneration, they cannot see with their fovea. They have to see beside their fovea. And doing that, they cannot um, look straight to you, but they have to, to look next to you. And this is sometimes, uh, yeah, patients don't like that. And then we can give them 
prisms. So these are also uh, yoke prisms, and it's the the idea is that you shift away the 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 image uh, outside the 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 fovea region. And so, for example, this lady she has to look to the right uh, to see something and so you can give them prisms that they shift the image and with the prism glasses it looks that she looks straight to you and for them it's it's easier it's not that they have better vision but because you shift the image back to in front so they they don't have to look where is my 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 preferred uh, vision point let's say and then finally you can use prisms in for visual field defects uh, especially for patients with uh, hominis uh, hemianopsy here uh, high power prisms uh, are used as a field expander or a field awareness device and you put it on the spectacle at the site of the hemianopsia and the base of the prism is also to the side of the hemianopsia. So here you have uh, a left hemianopsia, and here you have the, the prism in front of the left eye and base out, uh, base to the left. And there are different types of um, expanders, visual field awareness systems. You can, you have uh, round ones, you can have them as a fresnel or as a uh, ground in prism. Uh, here also, it's a uh, part of the glass, uh, like this is Chadwick. And then you can always have, also have small. And it's just when they have to look where their hemianopsia is, that they use the prism to, to expand their visual field. So prism correction, we can use Fresnel prism, ground in prisms or decentration. Uh, we put the Fresnel prism always in front of the non-dominant eye. The advantage of a Fresnel prism is that it's light and thin. It can be applied and removed anytime. It's easy to cut and to custom shape. And it's uh, in our country, it's reimbursed on prescription. Disadvantage is that it gives more chromatic aberration, more reflection and light shatter. It gives loss of contrast sensitivity. It's difficult to clean, don't use alcohol. Uh, it discolor due to use and aging. And it, it reduces the contrast of objects viewing through the lens. And the more power your fresnel is, the less vision you have. Um, so sometimes it's, it's if you have like a 20 and nothing, it, it's difficult to fuse them also. Round in prisms, a uh, small prism, you can do it for one eye. My limit is three normally. Large prisms, you have to divide it for two eyes. The advantage is here it's easy to clean, it's just glass. Uh, it gives a better visual acuity than your Fresnel prisms and your um, contrast sensitivity is better than with Fresnel. The disadvantage is that anyway, you get due to the prism some chromatic aberrations, uh, also geometric aberrations due to distortion. The weight of uh, uh, prism glasses, they weigh more, they are thicker, they are more expensive and you have limited power. So in multifocal glasses, you're limited to six prism diopters you can put in the glasses with uh, unifocal glasses uh, to 10 prism diopters each glass. Of course, you can put more in, but then the glasses, they become quite expensive. Still 10 in a unifocal glass, it's still in the normal range, and till six in a multifocal glass. Limitation of prisms, they cannot correct torsion. But on the other hand, often if you correct your vertical deviation, the patient can cope with the torsion better. Um, we cannot use them often in very incompetent strabismus. We cannot uh, correct uh, diplopia due to anisoconia with it, or a central fusion disruption or ma macular distortion. Um, and it's, it's, it's uh, the inconveniences of 
patients with augmented prison power. This lady, she has, well, uh, she has been operated several times. She even, she has a minus, I think minus 28 or something like that. And uh, she has double vision, but um, she, have, she has really bilateral heavy eye syndrome, let's say, and she has prism glasses. And on top of the prism glasses, she has on both glasses for snell prisms to correct her diplopia. So um, oblique prisms, um, we use them when uh, we need to combine horizontal and vertical prisms, because then you have, you have a less prism power to put into the glasses. Um, there, you can calculate them as you can see here, or what I do, it's quite easy. I use this, um, uh, this tool and it's, uh, you can rotate it. So if I have here like, um, four, 10 base, uh, out and four base up, and then I immediately get how much it is 11 and the degree. So, but you can also do, of course, the, the calculation, but for the degree, it's quite simple. I know there are some apps also who calculate it for you. Here also, if you can bind this, and of course you can, can um, do decentration. This is useful if you have patients with uh, high plus or min powers, then it's better to do decentration instead of adding uh, a pris uh, prism in the, in the glass. And we know that um, the decentration is the diopter of the lens. Um, with the decentration in centimeters. And then of course, if you have a small diopter of the lens, you have to do a large decentration before to get any prism correction. In with a large diopter of the lens, you, you don't have to do a lot of decentration. For example, if you have somebody with a plus eight and you need prism power, then it's, it's, it's an advantage to do decentration. Sometimes you can combine the, the two, but I leave that to the optician. And then finally, so the prescription always use the smallest prism providing comfortable binocular single vision in uh, open space. Um, uh, the choice is based on the objective and subjective finding. So always check near distance and for distance, put the prism in a frame and let the patient go out, uh, walk around in the waiting room, perhaps read something and um, in oblique and or combined torsional deviation. Uh, what I already said that uh, if you can correct the horizontal and vertical deviation, then it's uh, easier to um, correct the, the fusional deviation. And I only one thing I wanted to say, and that's something I see that a lot of uh, people who are not um, familiar with prescribing prisms. So sometimes people complain of oblique diplopia, but it's not always necessary to correct the horizontal and the vertical deviation. Because if you have, uh, for example, an ISO at distance with a really very small vertical deviation, if they, um, decompensate, then you have the total deviation. So sometimes if you only correct the horizontal deviation, the patient is again able to fuse his vertical deviation or just the way around. Patients who have a decompensation of a vertical deviation, of course, if they uh, decompensate, they have also the decompensation of their horizontal deviation. So if you compensate the vertical deviation, yeah, with a prism, then they can cope their horizontal deviation. And that's what I often see by people who not like uh, in the optician, if they try, for example, to put prism, then they put, first of all, the prisms much too high. And secondly, they do and horizontal and vertical, which is not always necessary. Okay, thank you. Uh, Nomi Geruda, I saw that you wanted to ask some questions. Nomi? 
yeah, sorry, hi. Um, yeah, I had two questions. Um, one, I know that the Fresnel prism cause blur. Do grounded prism also cause some blur? What should I expect when I put the grounded prisms in no. terms of uh, visual acuity? Normally, uh, small ground in prism, they don't cause blur. Uh, if you have to give like 10, 10, uh, then you will have, if you look to the light, you will see some, some um, aberrations, but it's not blur really. Okay. It's more that if, the, if people uh, watch lights, then they will say, I see some colors around the, the light, but it's not a blur. If you, if, you have, if you need 20 prism diopters and you put it in a Fresnel, your vision will be less on that eye. If you do 10, 10 in ground prisms, then you will have the same vision as before. Thank you. And another question, um, if someone has a, like a constant um, six nerve palsy or something that I need to uh, actually fix one eye and I want to divide it in ground in prisms, is it okay or is it inaccurate? No, no, it's okay. Uh, if you have a six nerve palsy, well, if you think the six nerve palsy has a possibility to, uh, to resolve, uh, then, then I would not well, I don't know in Israel, but in my country, the ground in prisms, they are quite expensive. And a Fresnel is only like 56 euros. Um, and if we know that, that the deviation is going to be better, or even if the deviation is going to be worse, then I prefer the Fresnel because it's temporary. And if you mostly <coughs> give the ground in prisms, if, uh, if I know it's not going to change anymore and I will stick with, with, with prisms. Okay. But the, I think this it's also a little bit depending on where you live. I know, for example, when I was working in India, in India, the uh, ground in prism doesn't cost anything. Yeah, and the Fresnel, because they, it's from 3M, it comes from the States, it's expensive. So in India, it's much cheaper to give ground in prism than a Fresnel prism. So it, it, it depends really a little bit how the situation is in the country you live in. But, but if I decide on ground in, there is no problem to divide it? No, no. This with twice? Okay. No. No. Thank you. Hi, um, regarding like the grand prisms, um, I've, I've, I've been giving grand prisms for a long time. So, in, but in the past three months, I had two patients with um, eight base in, in each eye, eight base out in each eye, sorry, um, that did find the chromatic aberrations rather unbearable. Okay. Um, it hadn't happened to me in the past that they complained of the chromatic aberration and a decrease in, in, in VA. And it, correspond when I check them in the clinic. Um, I don't know if that's your experience too. Uh, on one of them, on one of them, I just changed to another manufacturer, I actually ch changed it to Zeiss, Germany. Mm -hmm. and, and it, it didn't solve better. the problem. No problem then. No problem then. Yeah, yeah. So manufacturer I found does have, does make a difference. But I, I got scared off by this whole thing and I started, I become more conservative. Um, yeah. But I'm not sure if I should be. No, but well, I, I perhaps yes. I think if 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 the prison correction becomes too high, then then yeah, then sometimes it's to to think also about surgery. Yeah. yeah for sure. If you have enough, well, I always say to the patient, I do like the 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 non-surgical management of diplopia, and I do the small deviation. And once the deviation gets too large, then it's it's the ophthalmologist who can correct the angle of deviation. And sometimes after surgery, you still need small prisms to to get rid of your diplopia. But it's it's correct. Actually, I say it till till then it's possible, but. Personally, I think if you go over six of prisms each eye, then it, it, it becomes more, it, less, less uh, you get less, well, not really less visual uh, acuity, but uh, you get more aberrations and uh, the patient complain because the glass is too thick. So uh, I think small prisms, it's, it's perfect. Large prisms, 
try to get them into surgery. Um, and another question, if just if I may, like uh, you had that neurodegenerative patient earlier mm -hmm. where you saw no deviation in the cover test. Yeah. Yet you saw a, a six prism diopters yeah. based down in the Maddox. Now, I've also experienced that a few times in the past few years, not many. Mm -hmm. I don't understand the me mechanism. <laughs> it's the opposite from ARC. No, 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 no. Because they have a gaze palsy, they're not able to make vertical movement. So uh, when you cover, they cannot make a vertical movement. Even if they have a vertical yes. deviation, they cannot make the movement. Okay, okay. That's why we don't see it in an objective way. Gotcha. More questions? Okay, so I have another quick one. <laughs> um, uh, I've stroke patients. Um, I've sometimes I've been frustrated by the fact that I couldn't fuse them. And mm -hmm. I guess maybe some patients you just cannot. And there's this foveal slip. You basically try and correct them. You come closer and closer and closer and then bang, it goes the other way. And I feel sometimes limited and I feel I've let go of patients that I could have corrected. And I don't feel comfortable with that. These patients, I would say, uh, you, you try to try till they fuse. Sometimes if you give them the prisms, because if you do it in the clinic, it just on a moment, then, then to give them the, the, the prism and that they try it at home. Or that you put it in, in a frame, put them in the waiting room, and, uh, and, and see if they, they're able to fuse anyway. And sometimes you just have to adjust a little bit the prism. That's, that's something you can try out. Or, don't, or those who don't fuse, sometimes they have another problem. Sometimes they still have a really small vertical deviation like 0 0.5, one prism diopters. And if we cover, we cannot see movements of one prism diopters. They, these are too small. And that's why then your Maddox glass is useful because then you can see if there is still a, an extra vertical deviation or look if there is no cyclo deviation because cyclo torsion is also an, an, a problem for fusion. May I add something? First, Daisy, it's really a wonderful morning. Thank you very much. As for the question about splitting prism, in restriction like in thyroid, sometimes you cannot split. So you need, if you want first try it, let them sit outside. And if it's not working, then you need to put the whole amount on one eye. And what I, I've never had that experience. We well, mostly because the the real uh, the 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 worst or the <coughs> the thyroid patients they have like large limitations. So uh, often you have to do occlusion till they they get into surgery. But uh, we do split them. I never had. Uh, it's because of of that they they cannot move the eyes. You mean? It's not only, sometimes it's not symmetrical problems. One eye can be medial and inferior rectus. The yeah, other yeah, 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 only yeah. one. So it's, it's, if it's not yeah, symmetrical, yeah. You, you always need to try. And of course, the goal is to, to split, but uh, some of them won't, won't receive it. Yeah, but again, I think if, if it's too... Uh, Thyroid, thyroid are difficult patients because they yeah. have very incompetent strabismus. Uh, so, yeah, sometimes it's it's yeah you they, they if if possible they they need to have like uh, inferior rectus and medial rectus muscle surgery. Correct. To enlarge their muscles again, we put them on loops, so we get like an, an enlargement of the muscle by loop recessions. Well, you cannot always do adjustable on the inferior rectus. They are too strict. Yeah, well, in, in, in my clinic, we, do, we never do adjustables. Uh, it, it depends on the surgeon, of course. And yeah. uh, there we, we, we use loop recessions. Well, every surgeon does, has his own technique, of course. Thank you.
Okay. Shall we continue with the next one? The yes, last please. one? <laughs> yes, please. Okay, you answered all the questions. Yes. Can I can I ask one more question? Yes, of course. So just can you uh, explain a bit more about cyclo deviation? How do I measure it? How do I do prisms for cyclo deviation? I'm not sure. I usually I give base in, base out, up, down. I haven't really done cyclo. I want to know what how do you just the patient rotates it himself or no. Um well when you have a torsion that you cannot correct with prisms, impossible. Yeah, but when you have like mostly torsion goes in combination with vertical deviations. And because you have your vertical muscles, they give torsion. Horizontal muscles, they don't give torsion. So if you have a vertical deviation and uh, you correct your vertical deviation, if necessary, also your horizontal deviation, and then when the patient has cyclotorsion, you will not have a very nice single um, image. But if you correct what you can correct, so the vertical and the horizontal deviation, you prescribe your prisms. And sometimes, that's what you hope, then patient, if they, the vertical deviation is corrected, they sometimes can cope with the cyclotorsion. So that's what I mean. So just you have a patient, for example, you have a patient with an acquired six, uh, fourth nerve palsy, you have uh, a hyperdeviation and an excyclotorsion. Yeah, the excyclotorsion you cannot compensate with prism. The, the vertical deviation you can correct with prism. So you correct your vertical deviation with prism and then you see. And anyway, he, it will be better because he will only have to correct his cyclotorsion and not his vertical deviation and cyclotorsion. So that's why, so, and it's a try, eh? it's not, and if it doesn't work, then again, that means that he needs uh, surgery because with surgery, you can correct the cyclotorsion too. Okay. Okay, last one. Um, binocular problems in age-related ocular pathology. So in this, I will not speak about uh, muscle palsies and things like that. It's what we see, uh, aging patient, patients with other, um, I, well, related ocular pathology. And we have both, we have two eyes. And what I sometimes find that an ophthalmologist, he looks to one eye and he looks to the other eye, but they sometimes forget that you have two eyes, they have to work together. And now in this lecture, we will see how many problems we can get when one eye gets different than the other eye. Some of the things will be a little bit the same as what we have seen and others will be others. Okay, so um, I think if I compare it when I started as an, uh, as an orthoptist, then I see that during the last year, I see more and more elderly people than I saw before. And elderly people, they mostly complain about blurred vision, double vision, ocular discomfort. and um, sometimes if the ophthalmologist doesn't find the reason for why the patient is complaining, he sends the patient to us. And then we have to find if there is a binocular problem for the problem, the, uh, a binocular reason for the problem the patient has. And another thing I think is very important and I think we are very good in that, that we have to um, explain the patient in a very clear way, in a very easy way, um, what's the underlying problem, because um, 
when the patient understands what his problem is, he can cope better with the problem. And sometimes I, I have the, the, the impression that I have more time or I can put myself on a lower level that I can explain it more in patient's uh, way of talking than my colleague, the ophthalmologist sometimes. So the complaints can be diplopia, blurred vision or ocular discomfort. We already know that monocular diplopia may come uh, because of uh, a lot of reasons that I have said before, these are all the same. And that binocular diplopia can come because of a misalignment of the eye. Uh, but also when one eye has another uh, image than the other eye, without misalignment, we can have binocular vision problems. Because fusion is good when we have two uh, images who are the same. When we have one blurred and one clear image, it's difficult to fuse. Okay, so causes of diplopia related to uh, other things. Of course, we have the age-related anatomical changes. Uh, we know that by age, we got limitation of eye movements, uh, like we already said, to a sagging eye syndrome uh, by sagging of the pulley. So your elevation is getting worse. And in, if you compare it depression, depression stays good, elevation gets worse, the abduction will get worse than the adduction, and when we have asymmetry, we get intermittent of permanent diplopia. Well, these patients we can easily correct will, with prism and mostly have, uh, alleviate the diplopia, what we have seen before. Also, convergence may become more difficult and will give horizontal diplopia at near. And um, often older people, they need a higher reading addition if they are, for example, low vision patients, but a higher knee, uh, reading addition, uh, like those who need uh, magnification of uh, two, three times, they get like a plus eight, plus 12, addition in, in their glasses, which means they have to read at a very close distance and they will have double vision because they their convergence cannot cope with this small reading addition, uh, reading distance. So these patients, they really benefit of base in prism in their reading glasses. So if we give, uh, if we have a patient with um, with a lower visual acuity, and we can um, give better vision with, for example, an addition of plus four, plus five. Okay, but don't forget that with an addition of plus four, plus five, they have to read at a closer distance that you have to put prisms in the glasses too, because otherwise the, they, they cannot cope with that uh, shorter reading distance. And then what we have seen already, the age-related distance isotropia, uh, these patients benefit from base out prisms at, in the distance correction, or when the deviation becomes too large, they can benefit of surgery, of course, also. And then we have, of course, the long-standing strabismus, uh, a latent strabismus. We can have a fusion loss due to a decompensation of a heterophoria, and this can be due of age, but also surgery, cataract or refractive surgery, can um, give the compensation of a well um, corrected uh, heterophoria because you change the power of the glasses. Um, I've seen a lot of, for example, refractive patients with uh, not so high myopic patients who who compensate their exodeviation with their minus glasses. Once the, the myopia is corrected by refractive surgery, they cannot cope their exophoria anymore. And then they have, for example, double vision. Also vision loss by cataract can give that uh, a latent strabismus decompensate, retinal problems in older people. And uh, of course, changes in the magnitude of a latent deviation are due to fixation switch. 
And here, prism correction or surgery may elevate the diplopia. Um, this in a patient who had a manifest deviation, we can have suppression loss due to the direction of the a change in the direction of the deviation. We've seen that in the former lecture, uh, esotropia can drift to an exotropia due to low vision. And we see, or an exo can, can become larger. That change in the magnitude of the deviation. Uh, if you have a small exotropia, we know in a eye that doesn't see that the exo in time will get larger and surgical overcorrection. We have seen that. And this uh, here, prism or surgery will uh, be the solution. And uh, we have diplopia because the the, the object of regard of the deviated eye may be shifted out of the suppression range. Then uh, changes in the refraction or the effective correction, a fixation switch diplopia. Uh, we get diplopia when the non dominant eye becomes the dominant eye, the fixating eye. And this can be due to uh, because the fixating eye becomes more myopic. You know, due to cataract, your refraction may change. Sometimes your eye gets more myopic. And if the myopia is more in the dominant eye, patients need to fixate with the other eye, and that can be uh, cause a fixation switch diplopia. Also, if you have that you get low vision in your fixating eye, in your dominant eye, uh, due to macular problems, due to cataract, it can give diplopia. Inaccurate refraction, sometimes people don't wear the, the proper glasses, or monovision to treat presbyopia. We all know in refractive surgery that monovision is often suggested, sometimes also after cataract surgery, but it may um, give diplopia because latent deviations, they cannot be compensated anymore. So in this case, you need that the preferred eye or dominant eye try to get it the fixating eye again. It depends, of course, but in cataract surgery, you can, uh, if it's caused by cataract, you can operate the cataract. Of course, when it's caused by macular problems, it's more difficult to treat. Uh, if it's caused by uh, inaccurate refraction, then there is no problem. If it's caused by monovision, then it means that people are not a good candidate for um, monovision. So it's uh, mostly that you need to adapt the, the, the power of the glasses. Multifocal glasses may be a problem. Uh, for example, in patients with A and V patterns, if they have to look down and the deviation is larger or in ESO or in EXO, they can have double vision there because they were used to, to, to look like that. And now they have to look this way. And if your deviation is larger looking down with the multifocal glasses, it may be a problem. So. Uh, it's not a good idea to give them the multifocal glasses. And the same when you have a vertical deviation, which increases in down gaze, it can give you double vision when with your multifocal glasses, because you have to uh, look more down than with normal glasses. And the same with the limitation of suppression. So in these spaces, uh, multifocal glasses are not the, the good uh, glasses. It's better to give them two pairs of glasses. Uh, another way that patients sometimes have binocular vision problems is when they get new spectacles. For example, these spectacles and these spectacles, uh, it can be a different type of frame. Sometimes you have round glasses and they go to um, triangle or um, square glasses, and it can give um, difficulties, especially if you have like uh, heterophorias, which are not very good compensated. And, uh, and because also of the, the center of the glasses. So patients sometimes wear decentered glasses, then they get new glasses, and then the center is correct, but then they see double or just the way around. And then, um, they or the head prisms in the glasses, they get new glasses without prisms. So think about it if you don't find anything. So uh, 
measure the glasses, measure the center of the glasses, and uh, check if there was a prism correction in the former glasses, or perhaps there is some in the um, present glasses. Also, don't forget that in multifocal glasses, you always have a prism to bring the, the reading uh, part up. And if you prescribe vertical prisms, they often don't calculate it or they calculate it in a different way. If a patient switched from contact lenses to spectacles, it may uh, result in a deterioration of ocular alignment. And uh, so uh, because of the different in prismatic effect of contact lens and glasses, this is especially in a high um, uh, power of glasses. You don't have it in a plus one, plus two or something like that. But if you go to plus nine or plus eight and you switch from glasses to spectacles, you can have these problems. And um, sometimes because of economical reasons, they say, ah, you don't need to have a correction in your amblyopic eye. Uh, and before they had a correction in front of the amblyopic eye, this can also give problems because uh, each number of the glasses gives some prismatic uh, effect. And if you get rid of the, the glasses, it can deteriorate your uh, previously alignment. So. Uh, only a um, deep, but very, very deep amblyopic eye, you can say, okay, get rid of the glasses. But if you have like still vision and especially per peripheral vision in the eye, then you may not quit the, the, the correction of the amblyopic eye. Macular pathology can give um, binocular vision problems. Retinal winkling or macular derangement can give a mechanical displacement of the affected fovea, which means that both fovea, they are not longer corresponding retinal points anymore. And these patients may complain of diplopia. And they mostly complain of a small vertical diplopia. And if if, and you see a very small angle hyperdeviation. Uh, there is no uh, cyclovertical muscle dysfunction, so your ocular motility is completely normal. Mostly it's due to epiretinal membranes, subretinal neovascularization, or central serous retinopathy. And it's more common than you expected. So, and how do you test it? Um, well, it's if you, um, if they are complaining of double vision. So normal, you see one screen and one E, and these patients, they will see one screen, but they will see two E's. So this is not really double vision. If you see two um, E's and two screens, then it's really vertical diplopia. And this is what I mean with the drag macular syndrome, as they call it also, and it's you that in the macular, you have like a little vertical deviation, but the rest of your retina is completely normal. So in this case, diplopia does not respond to normal prism correction. So when you check these patients with the prism, you can just correct the diplopia to superimpose the two images, but the rest of the retina has not this uh, deviation, it's only the fovea. So um, if you give a vertical prism, then for the fovea it will be good, but the, the normal peripheral retina not, and it will give you back diplopia. So um, you will have a momentary foveal alignment, but the peripheral fusion mechanism is stronger, and both foveas are again are pulled apart and diplopia will return. So these patients are helped with, uh, for example, riser filter, or Mangerinter filter, I don't know how you call it in, in Israel, and they may uh, relieve the diplopia. Uh, another thing with macular problems is that often they also have anisoconia together with their macular disease. A separation or compression of the photoreceptors can be a 
contributing factor to the existence of diplopia and the inability to fuse in patients with macular disease. And don't forget, these patients have low vision, so they are already more difficult in things to do. So these uh, epiretinal membranes, they can cause that the perceived image in the affected eye to be larger uh, uh, because uh, the photoreceptors are compressed, as you can see here, or they can be smaller because the photoreceptor are stressed. Uh, so you have less photoreceptors, so you will see the image smaller. Here you have more photoreceptors, so you will see the image uh, larger. And so patients with subnormal vision or macular distortion, they, they cannot cope as good as patients with good vision with anisecopia. And we can normally um, cope with about 5% of anisecopia, but people with low visual acuity have less uh, possibility. Um, um, Multilens, it's a Swedish brand. They have these anisiconia spectacles, glasses, and they can magnify a little bit the, the smaller image. So the both um, images are a little bit the same. Uh, perhaps I, I only know this brand, perhaps there are others who do it also. Or again, also the research filter may relieve your diplopia. And then uh, binocular vision problems uh, caused by cataract surgery. So before cataract surgery, you have you may have pre-existing disorders that preceded the cataract surgery where you're not aware of. For example, myasthenia gravis, thyroid eye disease, cranial nerve palsy. I don't know. Um, in 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 my country, you don't see very. Uh, um, mature cataract patients anymore, but sometimes patients with very low vision due to cataract, they they don't see double because they 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 have so low vision that they're not aware of of, of diplopia, for example, and they can have other things. Um, another thing that's something that we don't see so much anymore, but if I go to Africa, there you see it, of course, that disorders pre uh, precipitated by the prolonged occlu occlusion by the cataract. So you can have sensory strabismus, decompensation of phorias, and that's the worst of all, of course, central disruption of binocular vision. If a cataract has been there too long, uh, we don't get any fusion anymore. Then um, that depends on uh, what type of, of cataract surgery they do, but the presumed tox toxicity or surgical trauma due to the extraocular muscles and orbital tissue. Uh, for example, direct myotoxicity due to the local anesthesia or injury to the inferior rectus muscle by the needle or uh, surgical trauma to the superior rectus muscle due to the bright fixation sutures or intraoperative traction on the muscle bundles. This depends uh, where you live, what type of operation is done. For example, we do mostly topical anesthesia, then you don't see that anymore. Uh, but still, if they still do retrobulbar anesthesia, you can see that. And uh, so it's sometimes it's still seen. And then, of course, the causes related to the resulted aphakia or pseudophakia and optical aberrations. So after cataract operations, sometimes you have an anisometropia because one eye is plus four. And after the cataract of the other eye, you have zero. So you have an anisometropia of four diopters, which also may cause anisoconia. This may also be a problem for binocular vision. Also the ocular uh, dominance reversal. Uh, so you have, um, cat you have on both eyes cataract, your non-dominant eye has more cataract, this eye is operated. And now the non-dominant eyes after the operation sees better than the dominant eye. And this can give binocular vision problems. 
solution, then you have to operate the other eye with less cataract also. And also if you have uh, different in color and brightness, due to the cataract, for example, this is the cataract eye and this is the operated eye, you have two different um, yeah, color perception, brightness perception, this can result in uh, binocular vision problem. Not always, but if you have somebody with uh, uh, a poor compensated uh, heterophoria, then you may have problems. Glaucoma surgery. So after um, aqueous drainage implants to provide a permanent channel of aqueous flow from the anterior chamber to the collecting reservoir in the posterior subconjunctival uh, space. I cannot speak anymore. Uh, this can give you vertical diplopia due to an inability to elevate the eye due to the implant that is placed superiorly or due to an inability to depress the eye if the, um, the implant uh, is placed uh, uh, inferiorly. Uh, it's not something that you see quite often, but I think I have seen like only two patients who had an implant, this is one of them, uh, who had like a, 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 yeah, an, a, a ball, in the upper part, which got, which uh, gave a limitation of elevation. So it's something to think about. And then uh, retinal surgery. So um, retinal detachment surgery may give uh, binocular vision problems due to restrictive strabismus, due to the adhesions, the muscle fibrosis, or the scarring involving the buckle, a buckling material. It can give you horizontal and or vertical diplopia and limitation of ocular movement. And it depends uh, how much is done, but it can give you quite some uh, limitations. So sometimes it's necessary to remove the scleral buckle if the retina is uh, flat, if there is no um, detachment anymore. Um, sometimes you need strabismus surgery um, in, in larger deviations. Uh, mostly you have to operate on the untreated eye because often the limitations in the affected eye, they are in both directions. So you have not much possibility to operate on the affected eye, but you need to go to the other eye. Prismatic corrections in the smaller um, deviations or after service surgery. And often these patients need to adopt a compensatory head posture. Then uh, this uh, macular translocation surgery is surgery what was done in Belgium quite a lot. Um, so in patients with um, AMD, they, um, they did um, a, a, a rotation of the macula. So in the middle, you got a, a better macula instead of your um, macula hole. So here, um, they when they did a downwards rotation, if you can see here, then they, they create large angle extortion of the operated eye with a negative vertical angle kappa in the, in the operated eye and exotropia and hypertropia uh, of the operated eye. And when they do an upwards rotation, then they, they create a large angle intorsion of the operated eye with a positive vertical angle uh, kappa and an exotropia and a an hypotropia. And of course, beside of that, they have very large torsional uh, diplopia and they have like torsional diplopia of 20 plus degrees. And of course, very uh, vertical and sometimes horizontal diplopia. And people sometimes come in with a, an abnormal head posture like, like this one here. So then what do you have to do? Well, you have, of course, to do only strabismus surgery on the oblique muscle and or uh, by a transposition of the vertical muscle. So in case of uh, 
in cyclo deviation, you have to do a globe ex cyclo rotation. In case of ex cyclo deviation, you have a globe, a globe uh, in cyclo rotation. Prism correction, well, cannot correct the torsion, but sometimes the remaining deviation. And uh, sometimes you have also then no extra to do the business surgery on the fellow eye. And then, of course, binocular diplopia is caused by paralytic and uh, uh, strabismus and neuromuscular diseases, uh, which uh, is not uh, um, related to the eye. It's uh, it's something else. So that is we are not going to uh, discuss. So uh, the blurred vision uh, may be caused of any alteration in the pathway of the light from the cornea to the retina. Uh, um, this also disorders of the optic nerves can give blurred vision. Uh, can be monocular and binocular. And also don't forget that patients who have a little bit of diplopia may complain of blurred vision because it's not really double the image, but it's just a little bit um, moved. So it's it gets blurred without really being double. Um, then uh, ocular discomfort, where each patient uh, complain of halos. This is normal. This is when a patient has halos. This is not very nice when you have this. Uh, if you have diplopia and halos, then it's even worse. Uh, sometimes they have also halos and starburst, as you can see here. And uh, the worst of all, if you have all of it together, diplopia, halos, sturbus, then uh, I think you prefer to have no vision in one eye instead of all these things. So thank you very much. And thank you very much for listening all the time to me, so many hours. Uh, I think it must be very boring. No, no. First of all, thank you for your effort. It was fascinating to hear you as always. I get kisses. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. I know uh, it's much uh, nicer to be here in person and hopefully in the future uh, courses, we'll be able to have you here in person. Yeah. Um, I like to come again, definitely. <laughs> you may always count on me, you know that. Yes, uh, it was really, I think, very, very, very um, open, opened the mind of a young orthotic student, uh, what can be done uh, in this amazing uh, profession. I see that we have a one question, uh, Doron. You're muted. This should be better. Yeah. Um, I just want to say two things. First of all, it was a very important review also for an old ophthalmologist, not just a, a young orthoptist. And I just wanted once to argue with your opening remark that uh, sometimes uh, you have more time and more common language with your patient than your colleagues the ophthalmologist. I think that if an ophthalmologist doesn't have the time and the ability to find the language to speak with his uh, patients or patients' parents, maybe he should choose a different line of occupation. Yeah, correct. But it's it's my experience that I have sometimes. I know, but it's, it's not, not a, uh, it's not justified. Yeah, no, no, and it's what the patients sometimes say. And I I sometimes when I go to a specialist, sometimes they they say things that I don't understand. So my you daughter, need a, you need a different specialist in this yeah. case. My daughter is now in her last year of residency of ophthalmology. And I always say to her, you really have to explain it in the language of the patients, because otherwise, if you don't explain it well, I don't think the patient will do what you say. I know. They should learn this in the first day in medical school, you yeah. know, not, not one year before finishing residency. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. It was very interesting. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Okay, so thank you also everybody who participated and thank you, Daisy. And um, we will be in touch. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me and uh, have a nice day. Bye-bye.
Thank you very much. Have a nice weekend. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye.